Jesus! He's not a cheap shark. We're live from the Rainbow Hall in Nagoya, Japan. Originally built in 1986, the Rainbow Hall has hosted such diverse activities as sumo wrestling and musical concerts by Whitney Houston, Phil Collins, and Eric Clapton. But tonight, 10,000 people are packed in here tonight to witness the Pride Fighting Championships, rising stars versus KG veterans. Working with me at ringside is a man who needs no introduction the world over in mixed martial arts. And welcome back to Pride Resurrection, the historical video series dedicated to the Pride Fighting Championships, where with each episode, we'll take a look back at a specific event from Pride's history. And today, dear viewers, we're going to take a look back at Pride 9, New Blood. I am the most dangerous man alive today, joined by the Colombian Good Vibe. Woo! There we go. That's energetic. <laughs> I didn't like it last time. I liked it this time. That was good. And the machine. Oh, he's not here. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of the machine, did you hear? Did, I don't know if you read um, the machine, like the MMA fighter, uh -huh. just got sentenced. War machine? Yeah. 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 Dude, just, what was he sentenced to? Uh, I was following. I've seen that the the case. Uh, some of videos on YouTube. Uh, yeah. I, I I actually don't remember what the sentencing was. I think it was like a couple of years or something like that. Yeah. It's June fourth, two thousand. A little more than a month after the conclusion to the Pride Grand Prix of two thousand, and the Nagoya Rainbow Hall will see blood. New blood. Well, some new blood. <laughs> I was going to say, half, yeah. at least half the card is old fighters. Yes. A bout of spectacle await us, showcasing various blood-filled organic sacks known as humans participating in extreme demonstrations of violence. How many have come to see this amazing event, you ask? Unknown as official attendance for Pride 9 is never stated, but I do know this, the Rainbow Hall of Nagoya can hold up to 10,000 fans, and Steven Quadros in some taped monologue portions says that 10,000 fans have come to see the fights, so it must have been a sellout. Quadros and Boss preview the fights for us. By the way, never, I, I honestly, what, we're how many episodes in? I had no idea what Quadro looked like. Oh, you didn't? <laughs> I none. Like the only reason I know Boss is because he's he's actually shown up in right. uh, like ringside. Yeah. I had no idea what Carter looks. He looks like a fucking. And by the way, very fitting since we're filming this <laughs> on St. Patrick's Day. He looks like an Irish Kevin Bacon. <laughs> yeah, he does. He does kind of look like <laughs> Kevin Bacon. Quadro said, "Boss, preview the fights for us in this rip that I have, and it's all pretty cool. The production value, especially in terms of presenting pride, is something that manners has finally come into its own." Uh, no, you don't agree? I mean, production values, yes. The fact that they even have this intro for the fights, it's great. The intro itself was like, what the fuck are they doing? Like, they do, they do like every fighter name in this like retardedly gay robot voice. Yeah, that you can barely fucking understand. The robot, it was it was kind of kind of stupid. <laughs> By the way, the other thing I wanted to point out about the intro, and it is one of my biggest pet peeves, the phrase needs no introduction. <laughs> yes, because that's a fucking introduction. Don't say, oh, he needs no introduction. But we're gonna here do it. He is. It's like, oh my god, I'm gonna punch you, Gladys. I just met you. <laughs> Before we get into the event. What else was happening in the MMA world around this time? Across the Pacific in America, 1,100 drunks turned out for UFC 26 Ultimate Field of Dreams, which was held on June 9th in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. So they built it and they came? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Some of the fighters featured that evening included MMA journeyman Shoney Carter, Jens Pulver, Matt Hughes, and Pat Militic. But the main event that evening saw Kevin Randleman taking on Pedro Hizzo for the UFC Heavyweight Championship. Kevin would win via unanimous decision after five rounds. This is part of the reason why Kevin Randleman didn't participate in the Grand Prix. He had extended his contract with the UFC and that will keep him away from Pride for another couple years. Meanwhile, just a day prior to Pride 9, K1 had an event over in Switzerland, K1 Fight Night 2000, which featured a young Miracle Crow Cup, a man who needs no introduction. Oh my god. <laughs> I fucking hate you so much. And I don't introduce him. Being defeated by Andy Hugh by a unanimous de decision. It must be known that Hugh, a kickboxing legend, would die only two months later on August 23rd from complications from chemotherapy treatment for leukemia, only two weeks after the last fight of his career. We won't see Crow Cop in action until Pride 17, where he will debut against Nobuhiko Takata, insane, no. Are you kidding me? He still fights? Yeah. Fuck you, Takeda. <laughs> With that out of the way, let's get into Pride 9, New Blood. No, oh, I love Pride. Uh... I've gotten much faster. My my stand-up skills have become, have become much uh, more deadly, and hopefully now I've become more of a rounded fighter. I'm not so one-dimensional anymore. <laughs> I enjoy every day of it, uh, and if you don't, I think you need to seriously consider what you're doing. Uh, if you don't enjoy getting up every day and doing it, then uh, what's the point? <laughs> Willie, I'm coming at you, man, and I hope you're ready. Then I hope I will, uh, I will show a good fight. sees two newcomers to Pride as the Texas crazy horse Heath Herring from the USA who was 22 years old at the time and had an MMA record of 13 and 5 takes on Willie Peters from the Netherlands who was 34 years old and had an MMA record of 9, 9, and 1. Willie Peters is a rings veteran having fought in 12 rings of vets from 1995 to 2000. Rings, which has a storied history of its own, came about in a similar fashion as Pancrase. Pro wrestler Akira Maida decided to start his own promotion after the UWF went belly up for the second time in 1990. In the beginning, Rings was just another pro wrestling slash shoot style promotion before switching to legitimate MMA in 1995. While in rings, Willie would lose to a young Shuyoshi Kosaka, TK, and also venerable Chris Hossman twice. And Mitsuya Nagai, a man notable for, for taking up kickboxing in 1997 and never winning a single bout <laughs> in his seven fight career. Other than rings, Willie also fought in the Mars event, that's martial arts reality super fighting on November 22nd, 1996 a one-off event that featured an eight-man tournament in which Willie would TKO his first opponent, Serge Narasayan, in the first round before running into a massive mountain man, Illinois pig fucker Tom Erickson, who would submit Willie at only 31 seconds with a neck crank. The Mars event also saw Henzo Gracie destroy Oleg Tokhtarov with an upkick KO. Willie also fought in a single World Valley Tudo event WBC 8 on July 1st, 1999. He lost that one. What about Heath Herring? Born in Waco, Texas, USA, Herring played football in high school before being convinced to take up wrestling in his senior year, where he would quickly become one of the top 10 high school wrestlers in the state. Herring then began training Sambo, and although MMA was still a tiny sport at the time, he decided to take it up professionally at age 21 in 1997. Debuting in Unified Shoot Wrestling Federation 4 on April 12th of 1997, he made short work of his no-name opponent, choking him out after two minutes. Herring would then fight Evan Tanner twice, back-to-back, -back, 
first in October of 97, then in November. Herring would be exhausted literally in the first fight before avenging the loss in the second bout with a rear naked choke. After taking all of 1998 off from fighting, Herring would come back with a vengeance in 1999, having 13 total fights that year, many of which happened in tournaments and going 10 wins, 3 losses record-wise. Some of these events included WVF Durango, Boss Rutan's Invitational 3, and the World Valley Tudo Championships 8, which happened in July of 99 in Aruba. How many invitations does Boss have? He had quite a few. And I think there's a DVD floating around out there with all of them, which would be pretty in interesting to get. Heron would make it all the way to the finals of that tournament, but lose to Alexandri Kosaria. <laughs> One of these times you'll get all the names right. Pride 50, here we come. <laughs> <laughs> but would lose to Alexandri Kakakero. <laughs> this guy's fucking name just confuses me. I see it. I see a jumble of letters. It's Kakarot. Kakareko. <laughs> Kakareko. Ferreira. But lose to Alexandra Kakareko Fiera in the finals. It was there in Aruba that Herring's talent was spotted, and he was invited to train in Holland with some of the best kickboxers in the world. And so he moved to Holland. Training in Holland must have helped because the next World Valley Tudo Championships in September of 99, Herring would win the whole shebang with two submission wins and then a TKO over Dirty Bob Schreiber in the finals. Just prior to Pride 9 here, Herring fought in IAFC Pancration World Championships 2000 in Moscow, Russia, but had his fight cut short when an actual case caused the doctor to stop the fight. His opponent was some Russian bear wrestler named Ramazan Mezidov. Video exists of this, and I have it. And that brings us here to Pride 9. It's, it's kind of weird seeing someone fight in a wrestling singlet. Oh, yeah, Willie Peters. Yeah. He's not even a wrestler. He's a... I, 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 that's the part I don't understand. <laughs> but, and the part that gets to me is like, do the rules follow them the same, it's the same as if you're wearing a gi? A gi? Like, can the opponent oh, grab it? Yeah. Because if so, I mean, why handicap yourself already? Why, why do stupid stuff like that? And not only that, if someone grabs it, can you imagine the fucking wedgie that that <laughs> thing is going to goddamn give you? Yes. Like, it's going to ride up your ass. Oh, my God, no. The, uh, so, this is kind of strange. You're right, because the gi opponents are allowed to grab the gi, but they're not allowed to grab shorts. So, I'm sure the singlet is the same way. They won't be allowed to grab it. And, and that's what I thought, honestly. But then it, put, it puts the other wrestler at a, at a disadvantage because, you know, I mean, it's kind of awkward when, if you're going to be trying to grab them and, and you're sneaking your fingers to the singlet. I don't know. I just, I just didn't like it. And I will also say, though, that, uh, oh, my God, Herring has the weirdest fucking facial hair. Yeah, ever. what the fuck is wrong with his eyebrow? In the pre <laughs> He's got those shaves. He, and I know that was a thing. You know, he has the weirdest <laughs> thing. It's like he shaved his head, but then left, like, the the, the mutton chops up. Yeah. But they didn't go into a beard. They went into a mustache. I was like, what the fuck is wrong with you, man? Yes. Awesome music during the shit talk segments here. Pride is really expanding their library of shit music, and I love it. By the way, speaking of, of, of expanding, who the fuck was that guy with the microphone? The, what, the guy with the slick hair and the glasses, the dark glasses? Yeah, something like that. I don't know, some Japanese-looking guy. Yeah, I think he was wearing almost like in a tuxedo. Yeah. Yeah, so that's the, that's the big-time Japanese announcer, and I don't have his name. It's a Japanese name. Oh. I would mess it up. Wow, um, a guy from Japan has a Japanese name? Yeah. <laughs> Color me fucking surprised. He'll be, featured, he'll be featured more in, like, the, the pre-taped uh, monologue stuff that him and uh, Quadros and Boss do. They'll bring him in, and he'll, he'll say some stuff in Japanese. Uh, he's very famous. I mean, he's got a, okay. a very famous voice. I was just confused because I'm like, who the fuck is this guy? Quadros and Boss note that Willie took this fight on five days' notice, and according to Heath Herring on Twitter, thanks, Heath, by the way, for replying, he also took this fight on short notice as well, so... One of those fighters you can really tell. <laughs> who, who were the original opponents scheduled for this fight? No fucking clue. Harry looks trim and tall. He's 6'4", and Willie has a singlet on. We get a shot of Atsuka for some unknown reason. Is he on Japanese commentary? Because they just cut to a shot of him, and he's just sitting there all by himself. Yeah, it's kind of fucking weird, man. They, they do so many cut shots of... 
Like, you're like, what? why? Why are you showing me this shit? Yes. Let's get into it. Round one. The men exchange a jab, then Heath with a tie push kick. Willie responds by rushing in with a leaping punch to no avail. Herring pushes forward with punches and pushes Willie against the ropes. Willie falls and grabs onto Herring's leg. As they hit the mat, Herring manages to take Willie's back. He then tries to sink in a rear naked choke, causing Willie to audibly groan. Back, working the choke. <laughs> Quadro says that Peters is in a no-win situation as Herring gets his arm under the neck and then Willie taps. Heath Herring, Victor at 48 seconds of the first round. That's a terrible fucking debut for Peters. Yes. Just fucking terrible. Because he didn't do jack shit. You know, he, he went for it and then got taken down and then provided no guard whatsoever. Herring must train with giants as the coaches and training partners who get in the ring to celebrate with them are just as tall as a 6'4 Herring. Fuck. Quick fight. Not much to say about it. Any final thoughts on Herring versus Peters here? Uh, is Peters ever going to be invited back? Because he should. <laughs> Jesus Christ. This is sad. Uh, uh, I, I have some notes I mean, on how that. the fuck does he... You said his record was like 9-9 nine, nine and something? or 9-9 nine, nine and 1. How the fuck did he get 9 wins? And rings, <laughs> rings. They try. Oh, trust me, rings didn't have the rings. Was pretty much pro wrestlers. He had just playing around with. The oh, okay, okay. That makes a lot more sense because after seeing this, I'm surprised he's not part of the Takeda Dojo. Herring. This is my thoughts here. Herring looks to be the next big thing here, and Peters is a rather mundane Dutch fighter. I expected Herring to win. Just not this quick. So, what would become of our two rough and gruff fighters here? Heath Heron would return to Pride at Pride 11, Battle of the Rising Sun, where Tom Erickson, Illinois pig fucker, will await him. As for Willie, this was it for his MMA career. He would retire from pro fighting after this and would never step foot in the ring again. We'll see you around, Willie. I do it all. I kick, punch, wrestle, submission. I fight. Real fighting. But yeah, uh, I got into the sport uh, a long time ago to see who the best fighter in the world was. And there are certain belts out there and everybody wants to fight for a belt. And once I got into the business side of this and I realized it's a business, belts mean nothing to me. Uh, all I want is the respect of the other fighters and want the respect to be considered one of the top fighters. And by, by doing that, you have to fight the top fighters. And that's all I'm looking for in this. A mensagem é que eu trabalho, é, isso para mim aqui é um trabalho, é um trabalho que eu levo muito a sério e que eu fico muito feliz quando eu vou aos Estados Unidos e vejo o público me reconhecendo nas ruas, me apoiando, torcendo por mim. Ao Canadá, eu não conheço o Canadá, mas espero em breve poder conhecer o Canadá, que é um país que me disseram muito bonito, muito acolhedor. É, eu sou amigo do Gary Goodwin, que é canadense, e eu espero um dia ir lá conhecer esse país. E a mensagem como lutador é o seguinte, gente, procurem ser sempre disciplinados, terem consciência do que o trabalho que nós fazemos é um trabalho muito árduo e que o lutador de Vale Tudo é um esportista que se dedica muito, se dedica muito para dar um bom espetáculo para o público que gosta dele. E torçam por mim, Carlão Barreto, que vai estar sempre fazendo um bom trabalho, dando um espetáculo legal para vocês. Valeu. go our next match coming out now is Carlos Barreto from Rio de Janeiro Brazil he is a jiu-jitsu stylist who is also trained in boxing 31 years old look at him he's ready he's tough boss he's in perfect shape and uh, the R's in Brazil you pronounce as H so you will say Barreto Barreto Carlos Barreto 100% Jesus <laughs> he's uh, currently with the Brazilian And here he comes, his opponent, Trey Trauma Telekman, from 
from the USA, fighting out of the Lions Den gym, uh, residing in Texas. He's six foot two, 223 pounds, 35 years of age, and he's ready to rumble. His corner man tonight will be out of the Lions Den, Jerry Bolander. Our second fight of the evening sees a returning Carlos Barreto, who was 31 years old at the time and had an MMA record of 10 and 2. He's facing off against newcomer Tracy Trey Teligman from the USA, who was 35 years old and had an MMA record of 6, 2, and 1. We last saw Carlos at Pride 6 losing a split decision against Igor Volchanchin. Between then and Pride 9, he only fought once at International Valley Tudo Championships number 12 in August of 99, where he beat Gary, who? Myers, after breaking Myers' leg Whoa. when Myers tried to block a knee from Barreto. But who is this man named Tracy? Teligman started his pro MMA career in 1995, debuting at Absolute Fighting Championships 1 in Moscow, Russia, a 32-man tournament that also saw Igor Volchanchin fight in and also the mutant Ricardo Moraes winning it all. Oddly, Teligman only fought once in the tournament, despite beating his Russian opponent. I'm not exactly sure why. Trey then went on to Super Brawl number one, the Hawaii based promotion. Love those names. <laughs> Super Brawl. God damn. Which was held in June of 1996. Trey mysteriously won the eight man tournament after winning only two fights. It would have required three fights. Not sure what the deal is there either. Maybe he came in as a replacement. Then came UFC 12 in February of 97 in Dothan, Texas, where the sexiest man in MMA, Vitor Belfort, a man we'll see later tonight, was Trey's opponent. But the fight was cut short due to a cut on Trey's face in the first round. Across the sea, Trey went to make an appearance at Pancrase, a live nine, where he fought to a draw against Kichiro Yamamiya, in October of 97, he stayed in Japan to fight at UFC Japan 1 two months later in December, where he submitted Brad Kaler via armbar. After a stop at World Pancration Championships 2 and beating up some nobody named David Rivera, Trey went on to UFC 20 in May of 99 to fight Pedro Hizo. Hizo would KO Trey after four minutes in the first round. And that brings us here to Pride 9. Lovely music for Trey during his shit talk segment. Oh my god, really? Really? Because I'm not gonna lie, my note is the music for these videos is so fucking weird. <laughs> it, yeah, I know. It belongs in porn. Yes. Like, yeah, like, that's I like yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm kind of recently single, so trust me, I know this. This is the music you hear in porn. <laughs> Trey said he got into the business to find out who the best fighter in the world is. We also get to hear from Barreto, who speaks in classic Brazilian rhythm and oddly blurts out that he heard Canada is a beautiful country and he has never been there. Every screen containing Telegman's name, they call him Try with a Y. Quadros and Boss discuss Brazilian top team as Barreto walks out to the ring, which is a now legendary MMA training camp in Brazil, and one that Barreto is a part of. Say Barreto, Barreto, Carlo Barreto, 100% Jesus. Huh. He's uh, currently with the Brazilian top team, a brand new franchise of former Carlson Gracie alumni. Yep, what you said, the Brazilian top team uh, team uh, has names like Murilo Bustamante, Ricardo Lavioio, Pepe, and Paolo Caruso. Very awesome. strong team. Teligman is fighting out of Ken Shamrock's lion's den. He walks calmly to the ring and then gets up on the apron. He removes his shirt and what the fuck? For those who don't know, Teligman does not have a right tit. What? How the fuck did I miss this? <laughs> you didn't see he had no right to No! It. It's conclave. It goes inward. They were talking about it. No! Quadros, I... Quadros has a hilarious comment here. I wasn't even... I, I might have not been paying attention to this point, but Jesus. Quadros hilariously says, this is not virtual reality or a special effect. Trey Telekman had an accident when he was one and a half years old, and he lost his right pectoral muscle, folks. 
so don't be shocked by the appearance because believe me he's passed all doctor's examinations and this is not virtual reality or special effects which i'm gonna totally rip and use in a future intro oh my god <laughs> telling man also has mark kerr in his corner according to quadros round one feeling out by both fighters then barreto delivers a low kick then more circling by the way the, and the circling one of the things i noticed and, it, and it's interesting is yep. you know trey has no a, right to it well we've already <laughs> established that apparently no but trey trey looks like he's taller he has more reach mm -hmm. than barreto but barreto's the one that's controlling the middle and i found that fucking impressive if the, if the shorter guy's controlling the middle yeah I mean, um I don't have their heights or weights listed, so I couldn't tell you who's taller or who's taller. I mean, but just, just looking at the fight, man, like, if you if you look at them, or maybe... I know Barreto was kind of lanky, though. Yeah. You know, but, of... I, but I don't think he's... Like, I don't think, I don't think he had the reach. Oh, uh, where was I? Barreto delivers a low kick, then more circling before a high kick attempt by Barreto. The ref calls for action! Uh, I'd like to be said that if... Talegman goes for a jab and then Barreto shoots, but Trey sprawls nicely and holds Barreto down in a forward headlock. Barreto manages to stand up and then the men clinch against the ropes. Trey tries to disengage, but Barreto holds him close, ever so tenderly. Knees by Barreto as Telegman is unable to respond with anything. Barreto tries a trip, but good balance by Telegman, who stays standing. Action! Calls out the ref, and Barreto knees again as we move into the corner. More knees and foot stomps by Barreto, before the ref halts the fighter and brings them to the center of the ring. Five minutes down, and the men circle. Trey goes for a lay kick, and Barreto clenches, taking Telegman to the ropes. Barreto tries hard to bring it to the mat before pulling guard, but nice scramble by Telegman, who manages to get on top and has Barreto in a forward headlock. Quadros tells us the rules regarding knees in this position. Now, in this position, we've got to mention the rules of pride. A fighter in Telegman's position cannot throw the knee while the fighter on the bottom in Barreto's position has all four limbs on the floor. But if Barreto were to lift one of his limbs off of the floor, uh, Telegman could throw either a nick, knee or a kick. Testing this theory, Telegman knees Barreto as Barreto lifts a hand off the mat. Yeah, but... The ref called him on. Yeah, the ref uh, admonished him for it. Yeah, but which, I think, and then he, he argues with ref saying he lifted a hand off his man. knee or a kick in this position like that. Yep. Hey, he's lifting his arms up, you see it. No, it's really smart what he's doing. It's legal. I mean, okay, I see that. I don't. I don't agree with it. Like <laughs> knees to the back of the head should be illegal, regardless. Like. Mm -hmm. And I mean, Barreto, yeah, he, he lifted his arm a little bit, but fuck that. That's still, t like, his position is still technically on all fours. Yes. Barreto pushes to get to his feet and Telegman knees as Barreto goes for his legs. Telegman falls to his knees and then Barreto pushes him down, getting into his guard. Three minutes remain in round one. Small punches by Barreto. The ref comes in then and moves the fighters out of the corner. I mean, the rope guys have been fucking slow for this fight. I mean, Trey has had a couple of times, and uh, Barreto too, where, where you see them grab the rope for at least a second before rope guy even tries to do anything. Yeah, there's one in here where the ref fucking whacks him, and I know I have it written. Yeah, no, no, no. Like, and that's the thing is, <laughs> but that was like the second or third time he was grabbing the ropes. Yeah. Like, the first couple of times, he, like, it honestly was like, he grabbed the ropes, nobody fucking touched them, and he let go, grabbed him again. I'm like, dude, fucking knock his hand the fuck out of there. <laughs> Slow work here as both men punch each other. One minute remains now in round one, and Barreto tries to posture up for strikes. Telegman stays defensive, not allowing much to get through. And then the bell rings, ending round one. This fight is two 10-minute rounds, as are all of the fights tonight. Thank God. Hey, I believe this is the first bribe where we have even rules throughout all <laughs> yes. the fights. Quadros talks about Barreto being the then current heavyweight champion of the IBC promotion. That's International Valley Tudo Championships. Carlos Barreto is the current IBC International Valley Tudo heavyweight champion in Brazil. And in those events, they allow headbutts, groin strikes, elbows. It's pretty hardcore. I, I, I think it's unbelievable. When you see those fights, that's bloody fights. Talking about bloody fights. 
We see Mark Kerr in Taligman's corner. Yeah, he's there. Nice to know. <laughs> Round two. After circling, Trey comes in with a body punch and the men clinch. Barreto throws a knee that connects and Trey is rocked, backing away and nearly falling to the mat. Barreto rushes in for the kill, but ends up just clinching Trey. Barreto pushes Trey towards the corner, and as Barreto tries to take him down, Trey grabs the ropes, earning him a yellow card during the action. Barreto succeeds in getting Trey down and is in his full guard, before Barreto pulls away and Trey turns, giving up his back. Barreto throws a few punches, and then Trey traps Barreto's right arm. Barreto works punches to the back of the head, gets a warning, and then he knees. And then the men stand up momentarily before Barreto shoots in again, but this time Trey sprawls. Teligman then stands up, and Barreto needs a rest, deciding to stay on the mat. After some barely committed kicks by a standing Teligman, Barreto stands himself. Barreto throws a right, then flies in for a takedown, but Trey defends and we are up against the ropes. Barreto looks tired here, and he tries to wrap up Teligman's leg to pull him down to the mat, but Trey with great balance as he resists it, and Barreto ends up falling down. Teligman is now in Barreto's guard. Teligman works body punches, but not a whole lot of output from either men. Quadros gives an overview of the rounds and decision scenarios for us. Under the rules of tonight's fights, uh, they are scheduled for two 10-minute rounds with a uh, two-minute rest period in between. If the fight is a really close one and goes to a draw, they will go to an additional five-minute overtime round, in which will allow either a KO, a submission, or the judges to render a decision. We have three judges working at ringside tonight. Teligman stands and so does Barreto. Barreto with an unwilling kick attempt and he is absolutely gassed out. Trey goes for a right and Barreto ducks and grabs a hold of him. He pushes Teligman back and then throws a knee that doesn't connect. Five minutes down in round two, just as Barreto throws a pillowy soft knee. <laughs> Boss asks who has the most condition and who wants it the most. Who's got the most condition? That's what's gonna happen. Who wants it the most? This is the moment. Barreto pulls Teligman away from the ropes and spins him down to the mat. Barreto is now in Teligman's full guard. Barreto tries a head crank, but nothing really comes of it. Quadro says that Barreto believes that God will help him win the fight. Then complete silence. Maybe as both commentators look up to the heavens and wait for it to happen. But God will help him, meaning Carlos Bajeto, to win the fight. <laughs> Pareto works small punches as three minutes remain in round two. Not a whole lot to note here, fight fans, as Pareto continues a steady, albeit light work. Boss says that he doesn't want to be the judge for this fight, and Quadros brings up his own past judging experience. I don't want to be a judge. You know, that's the reason, one of the reasons I don't want to be a judge. Well, I've been a judge before, and fortunately, most of the fights ended in knockouts, or because the, the tournament I judged, Don Fry was in it, and usually it's either kill or be killed with a guy like that, so I didn't have to worry about it. Well, only one fight went the distance. Yeah. Barreto has started to put up a little more oomph into his strikes, and then... The bell rings, ending round two. We'll head to the center of the ring to see if we have a decision. And the winner, as I had predicted, Carlos Barreto in a very tough strategic fight with Trey Teligman. No shame for Trey Teligman, he fought a great defensive fight. Carlos Barreto, welcome back to Pride, his second appearance here in Pride. And the judges have called it for Barreto, Carlos Barreto, Victor, with a two-round decision. Good vibe. What were your thoughts on Barreto versus Telegram? All right. So first of all, I think it was the five-minute call for the second round, mm -hmm. or three-minute call, something like that. the The announcer sounded like he was doing an evil laugh. Like to me, <laughs> whatever the fuck he said sounded like. <laughs> Barreto, the busier fighter, not landing significantly with his knee. Uh, was, what the fuck is going on? Uh, second of all, what was it? About two minutes before the fight ended, uh -huh. you know, Boston Quadro started talking about, you know, how this could be possibly a tie, a draw, and all yeah. that shit. And the entire time, I'm like, what the fuck fight are they watching? 
Because in my mind, at no point whatsoever did it ever look like it was going to be a tie. I knew Barreto was yeah. going to win. And, 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 I mean, like you said, it's he wasn't putting in heavy work, but he was putting in work. And he was doing so the entire time. And even at the, like, the start of the second round, he came in strong. Yeah, I would say that Pelman didn't do a whole lot. Barreto did most of the significant work. Yeah. Though he gassed out at the end, he still had enough composure to maintain his output. And you're right. I don't I don't see I guess you could say that it might have gone to a draw if you you're going on the judging criteria that well, he didn't really try and end it. Um and neither men really tried to go for the kill, so why don't we see another five minutes? But yeah, I, no, I think I, I think the judges smartly said we've seen enough of this. Let's give a decision, which is good because Barreto definitely, definitely he he deserved the win. Yeah. on those two, but based on just those two rounds, it wasn't a bad fight in my opinion, just not terribly exciting. But the two ten minute round structure uh, put in place here for all the fights kept it short enough to not become boring. Neither man looked too great though. So, what would become of our two rugged warriors here? Trey would return to Pride at Pride 13, Collision Course, where he'll take on Igor Volchanchin. As for Carlos Barreto, this would be it for him and Pride. I'm totally surprised. I'm serious. I can't believe that he wouldn't come back. Not sure why he never returned, though. He would go on a whirlwind tour of the MMA world, starting with a decision loss to Chris Hassman at Rings, King of the Rings 2000 in December of 2000. He then faced Gilbert Ivel at Too Hot to Handle promotion in the Netherlands in March of 2001. A strange match that saw Barreto get knocked out not once, but twice. How? I, video right here will show you. Following this, Barreto had several fights in small regional promotions, including the Hook and Shoot promotion. He did KO Ben Rothwell at Heat FC1 in Brazil in July of 2003. He also fought Fedor's Russian Mafia brother in the M1 MFC promotion in October of 2004, a battle he would lose via decision. Barreto's final fight of his career came at the Jungle Fight promotion, Jungle Fight 4, held in Brazil in May of 2005, where he faced MMA journeyman Vladimir Matryoshenko. Barreto would be TKO'd after only 26 seconds. Hilarious video included of this fight, where the ring is attired with fake jungle foliage the whole way around. Seriously? It's seriously. Jesus Christ. <laughs> they didn't call it Jungle Fight for nothing. Oh my God. Barreto would end his career with a record of 14 wins and 9 losses at the age of 36. We'll see you some other time, Carlos. And one fight is never the same as another fight. One place is never the same as another place when I get to travel. The people are never the same. So I feel that... Uh, Fighting is, uh, in one way or another, my life. The message is always believe in your dream. Never give up for what you believe. And the time and the time that I live in the United States, I was very proud to be there. Our third fight of the evening sees a returning Alan Goes, who was 29 years old at the time and had an MMA record of 4-1 and 2. He's facing off against a returning Vernon Tiger White, who was 28 years old at the time and had an MMA record of 14, 21, and 1. We last saw Allen at Pride 8, where he tapped out my fave, Carl Malenko. We miss you, Carl, wherever you are. As for Vernon, he comes into this match as the reigning King of the Cage light heavyweight champion. No shit. 
We last saw him playing around with Sakuraba at Pride 2, where he lost via armbar. Since then, he's fought three times, splitting a win-loss in the IFC promotion in 1999, with the loss coming against the aforementioned Vladimir Machushenko, and then, out of nowhere, he fought for the King of the Cage Light Heavyweight Championship belt in April of 2000 at KOTC 3, Knockout Nightmare, held in... California against Todd Medina, who came into that fight with a record of three and four. And I note that because this is your fucking title fight. You have Vernon Tiger White, who at the time had a record of 13, 20, 1, and 1. Jesus. And he's facing off against Todd Medina, who had a record of three and four. That's your championship match? Well, playing the devil's advocate, how many... Uh Main events that we have here in Pride right. with a fucking piece of shit to cater. Sure. <laughs> yes, I huh? see, I see right. your point. <laughs> That's the thing is record record main men. I'm not that, no a whole bunch of fights in Pride. <laughs> have you had these shit. fuckers that had like zero and something records yes. still fucking showing up to fight. Yeah, no, so, so. but in Pride's defense, they weren't fighting for a championship. Although you did have. Uh, Masaki Satake fighting for a chance for the Grand Prix, and then you also had Asumu fucker with the lightning bolts. Yeah, <laughs> I mean that's the thing. Is is every, every championship has these fights that you look at and you're like, oh, I won whatever drugs you were having when you thought this was a good yes. Idea. <laughs> Medina, by the way, is notable for having previously lost to Minoru Suzuki and Pancrase and also Gilbert Ivel in the World Valley Tudo Championships. Vernon, by the way, did his own knockout nightmare against Medina in, get this, nine seconds of the first round. Smells kind of fishy, don't you think? If I wanted to spend 98 cents, I could purchase a used DVD of this event to analyze it for myself. But it doesn't seem worth it. Hey, man, go make it in hail. <laughs> Much better waste some money. Anyway, it's a battle of two after runs of Kazushi Sakuraba. But who will be the victor? Vernon White has no time to acknowledge his introduction or applause. They both were after the fight. They were so tired. They didn't come out. And he even got Vernon Tiger White. Phone paint. Yes, Vernon Tiger White also. Yeah, but they didn't get an entrance. He didn't get that. No, yeah. No, they, it was weird. They, they picked and choose who got entrances. His entrance, actually, for this one, on uh, on the DVD, the the robot voice, yeah. he had glasses. It looked fucking awesome. I'm like, why didn't they include that? Yeah, he looked know. like he was ready to go. But Yeah, yeah I, was, I was surprised. Also, um, two things. First of all, I will never, ever, ever, and you can hold me to this, <laughs> listeners, I will never not laugh at a black guy named White. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's funny as all hell. It is. It is fun. It is funny. Like kind of like Mr. Black. Yeah. From The Simpsons. Yeah. It's white. It's always, always fucking hilarious when that happens. And, and people will kill me for this. I really hope Alan goes to town. <laughs> <laughs> Round one. The men meet in the center of the ring, and Alan rips off a high kick. Then White answers with a low kick. Then a one-two. Then a body kick that is caught by Goes, and he takes Vernon down to the mat. I was gonna say that kick looked really fucking hard, and I was like, is it really worth it to take that kick? Because like, it, yeah. oh, holy shit, like it looked like it hurt. Absolutely. Goes is in White's full guard, and White has him locked down right now. Quadros mentioned that Goes has over 200 jiu-jitsu matches in his life. And that growing up in Rio offers a lot of opportunity to, apl to apply your craft on the street. What a great country, Boss replies. Alan has, uh, has over 200 victories in various forms of jiu-jitsu, sport jiu-jitsu, street fights, what have you. Um, growing up in Rio, you know, there's uh, a lot of opportunities to ply your craft on the street. Yep. yep, yep, yep Much yep. like Holland, huh, boss? Yes, I think so. What a great country, huh? Alan looks to pass and gets in the half guard and works some body punches. Boss suddenly decides to introduce his Tony Montana impression. Oh, my God. <laughs> and in a, in a hilarious Monkey bit, Christ. he asks himself what he thinks of this fight. Hey, we got Tony, Mon Tony Montana, man. What are you doing here? I am Tony, boss. What do you think of this fight, Tony? Tell me. Tony, man. I look like a cockroaches on the floor, man. 
Okay, I told you you can't say that. I'm sorry. Of course, Boss would also introduce his impression in earlier prides in commentaries that were, of course, recorded after this event. Quadros flops between calling Alan both Goes and Goesh. Alan Goish. And brings up a story of Alan being trapped in the Amazon jungle for three months. Was in the Brazilian army when he was 18 years old, and there was a time where he actually got trapped and stranded for three months in the Amazon jungle with his with his company, and he survived. Unbelievable. Eh? And he said that that made him into a tougher guy. It got him in touch with his, with God, and it got him in touch with. Uh, his, uh, his fear for three months. Boss then talks about Goes being heel hooked by Frank Shamrock and Pancrase and how Goes said he would never tap out in which he ended up fucking up his foot. Five minutes pass in round one and we're still here with light work being done by both men. This is a bit of a boring fight to the casual fan which Quadros talks about and how that plays a role in promoters choosing who to have fight at their events. And that was hilarious because I literally started thinking that. I'm like, this is fucking boring. They started off so strong and I'm like, I'm about to start typing this and then they start talking about it. I'm like, oh my God, that's me. They're talking about me. I'm the kind of guy, fight, fight fan. Well, technically fight fan. We'll go with that. That, that what, you know, yes, I understand the technicality of it and I understand that yes, to, to do what they do is really hard. But fuck, is it boring? Yes. Especially when they started off so strongly. While this is going on, Goes manages to get into full mount and looks to maintain balance on top of Tiger White. Three minutes left, and Goes works White's side, but then he slows down. Vernon seems unable to come up with any answer here, and he should be moving more. And just as I typed this, he tried a buck. Do more of that, buddy, that's good. Goes gets daring and goes up very high on the mount, perhaps to set up an armbar, but Vernon does a great roll and escape, and now they are both back to standing. Goes kicks and White punches, and then Vernon feints a kick, and then Goes shoots in to grab it. He gets a good body lock and forces Vernon down to the mat. We're down to one minute, and Alan tries to push the pace. Alan postures up, and then Vernon White gets busy with crazy bicycle up kicks. Vernon then does a back roll to get to his feet. Throw everything out, have a good finish of the first round, and it's good for the judges. Okay, Alan going for some up kicks, almost catching. Oh, Very Vernon, nice Vernon. back roll. The men grapple against the ropes, and then strangely, Vernon seems to pull guard, so Goes decides to slam him down to the mat. Boss approves of this, saying it's the same thing he would have done, except he would have jumped a little bit higher. Back, Vernon pulling guard on the ropes. Oh, that's the same thing that I would do, only I would jump a little higher. The bell then rings, ending round one. Boss loves liver punches as he and Quadros talk about this during a replay of the action. Well, there's a liver. It's a good side to punch, actually. Yeah, that is the liver. I love liver punches. But do you love liver? Uh, chicken liver, it's okay. Boss also thinks chicken liver is okay. <laughs> <laughs> I like chicken livers, too. I, I, I do, too, man. I, like, all that stuff, like all the entrails, like gizzards and chicken hearts... Those are delicious, man. Uh, can't say I've had any of that, but chicken livers, rumaki, very good. Round two! White rushes out, but doesn't do anything from it. Goes rushes in, and White pops him before they clinch, and then Goes swings Vernon down to the mat. Goes improves the half guard, and he's very nearly inside control. As he pulls his leg out to pass, Vernon tries to turn, but actually gives up mount, as he does. Goes with slow work and he's not even thinking of punching here. He then decides to hammer Vernon with shoulder strikes, which is probably the first time we've seen them in Pride. They're surprisingly good shots. They are, and, and it's surprising because we've never seen them before. Yes. I've never seen them in no. any of the Prides or anything that we've watched so far. And it, and it, it's it's one of those things where like Boss and Quarter were like, uh, is that... <laughs> is that legal? Is, is, is that legal? Yeah. It's like, well, technically, it's you know, it's not a headbutt, so sure. <laughs> right. It's like, it's not a knee, so sure. <laughs> Quadros notes that there is no specific rule prohibiting shoulder strikes, 
So they must be legal. Technically correct. The yes. best kind of correct. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Despite the very dominant position, Alan seems to not be doing anything. He doesn't seem to be looking for a submission. He doesn't seem to be setting Vernon up, and he is definitely not going for the kill. Sensing this passiveness, Vernon neatly rolls, turns Goes, and escapes getting to his feet. He then kicks at Goes, leaping in with a skipping kick to the face. Vernon then traps Vernon's foot, and Goes goes to trip Vernon, but Vernon grabs the ropes and is smacked by the ref. Vernon then is toppled down, and Goes climbs into half guard. Quadros talks about the technology of the sport and how mount isn't as deadly as it was before because of advancements in knowledge. You know, it's funny because the technology of the sport has advanced like, to where it said it's five years ago, the mount of position you were finished, but now uh, fighters like the Lions Den fighters and others, they get in the mount with somebody like Alan Gush, who's got a great mount, a great guard, and a great ground fighter, oh, yes. but it did not threaten him because he popped back up. Yep. I think side control, I think that's one of the best positions to be in. Go to the side, from there you can go for almost everything. You can, you can take leg locks, arm bars, you can punch, you can elbow to the body. Boss states that side control is one of the best positions, and I wholeheartedly agree. Side control offers way more options in terms of finishing opponents than mount. Well, I mean, a, a side's a little bit harder to even defend against, because when yeah. you have someone full guard, they you, have they have they're right in front of they you. They have right in front of you, and they have both arms to lock your two arms. Yeah. Meanwhile, with 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 side position, you have one of their arms probably locked out, mm -hmm. and you have you can knee them right in right on the side. And there's no way to defend them, it, yeah. and you can't really defend that. Five minutes down, and we're back to Go's measured work. That is to say, slow. Go's is back in mount now, but we're trapped in the ropes. Yuji Shimada, the ref, might be waiting for his moment to move the fighters. More shoulder strikes from Allen. Three minutes left and the refs come in to move the fighters out of the ropes. More shoulder strikes from Goes that are right on a button, then punches. One minute now and Allen pushes more to get, Allen pushes more to get throw strikes. What the fuck did I write? <laughs> One minute now and Allen does something I don't know what I wrote here. He then postures up and rains down strikes. Vernon weaves and bobs covering up, then he fires back from the bottom and then the bell rings. We'll go to the judges to learn our decision, which is... Excitement. Alan goes, winner via decision after two rounds. Unsurprising, really. It was. It was completely unsurprising. Because one of those things, Alan had the control the entire time. He had the, he had the match. I'm, I'm sad that he didn't end it, but... Yes. Alan gets his odd little trophy, and then we're off to the next fight. So, what were your thoughts on Goes versus Tiger White? I mean, it was a good match. Like I said, for me particularly, it started off as a good match. It did not end as a good match because as much work as it is being on the ground, it does not make it for interesting fighting. Yes. And, and like I said, I I, I admire the fighters and. I know it takes a lot of skill to do that, and go and and Alan goes definitely you know goes the distance. Uh, so so I, I so so I, I 100% give him the give him the fight. It's just for me it was fucking boring. Yes, uh, I'll say this: Vernon looked good, even though he lost. Uh, goes looked good as well, but there was a decidedly lack of attempts to end the fight by either men. Neither seemed really serious about knocking out or submitting the other men. It was almost like they were. Sparring. So, what would become of our two feisty fighters here? Alan Goes would be back in action at Pride 13, Collision Course, where Mark Coleman, reigning GP champion, would mark his return to Pride in March of 2001. As for Tiger White, this would be the end of his Pride career. He would never return to the land of the rising sun, but would continue his MMA career in the USA all the way up until 2010. After Pride 9 here, Vernon would defend his King of the Cage belt four times before de being defeated by Jeremy Horn at King of the Cage 23, Sin City, in May of 2003 in a decision loss. He would go on to fight in the UFC twice, once against Chuck Liddell, which happened at UFC 49 in August of 2004, in a battle that Vernon claims Liddell 
I gouged him and broke his orbital bone. Video included right here. It apparently happened with the finger at the end of a punch, which was declared a knockout, but it's hard to see the eye gouge happening. This would be a $38,000 injury to Vernon, a bill which the UFC would surprisingly pick up. Holy shit. Thirty. Thousand? $38,000. Holy fuck. <laughs> After that, Vernon would face mostly small named fighters besides one named Leoto Machida, whom he would face at WFA Kings of the Street in September of 2006. Machida would win via decision after three rounds. Vernon would end his MMA career with a fight against Jason McDonald in March of 2010 in Canada at an event called W1 Bad Blood. Vernon would lose via triangle choke in the third round, finishing his career with a record of 26, 33, and 2. And that's all I can say about Vernon Tiger White. Godspeed, Vernon. We'll see you around. And <laughs> his name is White. <laughs>
これはグリーン今までの試合でも見せてきたようにこのコーナーパスと背後に回しての攻撃に出るかそのままグリーンアウト続きだ続きだ絶対続きだ明日からのアッパーを気が出てますねオールウール系の恐ろしい場面がまた早くもさあまさにこの画面上皆さんこの熱気をすぐに入ったいやー、ちょっと待って、ちょっと待って、ちょっと待って、ちょっと待って、ちょっと待って、ちょっと待って、ちょっと待って、ちょっと待って、ちょっと待って、ちょっと待って、ちょっと待って、ちょっと待って、ちょっと待って、ちょっと待って、ちょっと待って、ちょっと待って、ちょっと待って、ちょっと待って、ちょっと待って、ちょっと待って、It's his time now. As for Newton, like a lot of Canadians, he sounds like he has a complex over America being better. He doesn't fucking sound Canadian. He doesn't even fucking look Canadian. No. He doesn't. But he says he's tired of the Americans always being. Yeah, I know, but he, look, like, he literally looks Brazilian to me. Yeah, like, or like Jamaican. Something. Yeah, something like that, but not fucking Canadian. No, no. Sano has both Takata and Sakuraba in his corner. Fuck. <laughs> Takata, it must be noted, is only there to collect Sano's fight check. Sakuraba is likely there to try and pick up babes. No more bullshit. Sano is ready to destroy this Canadian fucker. Let's go. Round one. Sano with a laser leg kick. Wow. Newton wades in and taps Sano with an uppercut. They grapple, and Sano looks to use his muscles to push Newton around. Two knees by Newton, and then Newton forces Sano down to the mat. Not a problem, it's okay. You've been here before, Sano. Newton passes guard very quickly, getting into mount. Newton sets up Sano with distracting punches, and Sano stupidly leaves his left arm up in the air, to which Newton happily takes. And makes Sano tap out. Carlos Newton, winner at 40 seconds of the first round.、Uh, this, he's gonna work. He's、oh, gonna he's, be all over. He's, he's, he's got the mount. This guy's good. This may be over very quickly. Armbar, here he comes. He's gonna go for the armbar, arm left arm. There it is, there it is, there it is. And he's got the armbar to tap. A very quick victory there for Carlos Newton over a game but overmatched Naoki Sano. And the good sportsmanship there. Sano did take this fight on short notice because his, uh, uh, the, the, the original opponent、uh, came down with a、uh, tumor. A tumor. Whoa, whoa, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I blinked. What the fuck is happening? <laughs> Uh, I, I, did I miss something? Despite only taking one or two punches, Sano's face was already ready to explode with blood. Jesus, Jesus. what the fuck is wrong with Sano's face? Good vibe. Any thoughts on Newton versus Sano? I'll say this Yuhi Sano has no business being in an MMA fight. He apparently took this fight on short notice, so. I have to give him props for that. I don't. I don't have to give him jack shit. He's a member of the fucking Takeda Dojo. Yes. So, uh, uh, no shit, he lost. And him fighting here is only doing Takada favors, as Takada is cashing Sano's check. So, what would become of our two wrestling wrestlers here? Carlos Newton will return at Pride 12, Cold Fury, in December. Of 2000. There he'll face off against Yohil de Oliveira. That's pretty close. There he, <laughs> there, <laughs> a Brazilian Valley Tudo fighter. I'm moving on. As, <laughs> as for Yahoo! This would be the last time we'll get to see this bag of shit in Pride. Oh、prime. my god, thank you, <laughs> fucking Jesus. Or any MMA ring for that matter. Yuhi would go back to the squared circle, wrestling for the Noah promotion from 2001 onward. Noah, it should be noted, had some serious problems with Yakuza ties in 2012. No wonder he got a job there. <laughs> yes. As recently as 2010, Yuhi won the NOAA Tag Team Championships while tagging with giant man beast Yoshihiro Takeyama. The blonde haired monster we'll get to see as soon as Pride 14, Clash of the Titans. Of course, Takeyama will have a famous brawl with Don Fry 
at Pride 21. Can't wait until we get there. See you around, you he, and we'll miss you. Hashtag War Sano. Oh. Hashtag piece of fucking shit, Takeda. <laughs> And that brings us to the halfway point of our amazing event here. So, we're going to take a little break. So, won't you come join us as we play some video games? Yeah, video games! Welcome to Intermission. So we were actually going to go play Kung Fu Master as recommended by the Dope Da, but then I seen as I was searching for Kung Fu, I seen this Jackie Chan Kung Fu Master. So I'm like, Jackie we Chan. we have to fucking play this. We have to hey, look, it's that. Jackie Chan. Look at all those checks, man. Like <laughs> yes, and then check check, out. check 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 out my Valentine. <laughs> All right. All right. So, I'm gonna be... Um, is this a dragon? Is that what the <laughs> fuck this is? I'm two player here, and I'm gonna be this guy. All right, I'm gonna be the dragon. Thorsten. A fucking lion? What? <laughs> How is that a lion? Look at, look at this. <laughs> this no, look at this What guy. is that? This is that fucking... There's no way this guy's a lion. Oh, fuck you. Oh. <laughs> This is like a cheap Mortal Kombat knockoff, and it's actually pretty good. It moves really well. Yeah. Uh, actually, about ten times better than the fucking Tattoo Master game we played, the Tattoo Assassins. And I am fucking kicking your ass right now. But yeah, you are because I don't even know where my limbs Wait. are. <laughs> what did you just shoot at me? How do you do that? I don't know. You really asking me how I do anything in a fighting game? Oh. 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 This game is actually pretty... Wait, uh, what? What's going on? Holy fuck. Oh, I think you can finish me there. I don't see how. Set two. Not even a round. <laughs> we play tennis. <laughs> fuck you. It's going to be a perfect... <laughs> what? Oh! <laughs> no. Not possible. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, yeah. I saved myself from a perfect. What? How the hell? Fuck you, man! I have no idea how I did so much damage with two. Uh, yeah, yeah. I like you fucking took like three I'll give, this of my I'll give this game some credit. Usually these Mortal Kombat knockoffs with the digital fighters, they move so slow and are so poorly animated. Yeah, but I mean, this one actually moves very fluid. Although your character kind of sucks. No, my character, like you can't really tell. But look at how much damage you're dealing. Whoa! What did I do there? How did I do that? So I don't know what is the way to do the special moves here. I'm trying to figure out how to do a special. I mean, anything. so am I. You were shooting those little guys. I know, and I can't do it anymore. Oh, I, I gotta finish. I can't. No, stop. I'm trying. Get the fuck away from me, asshole. <laughs> I'm not losing this. Ah! Alright, best two out of three. Oh, I can finish you now. Uh, what the fuck was that? Oh, the crows come and get you? And the crows are eating the lion. <laughs> I like that little dance move. Though, this game is... Well, look at... It looks like it should be the cover of a fucking romance novel. Oh shit, Fabio! This game right. is obviously pretty limited. I'm gonna go with this Jackie Chan looking motherfucker. And I am... Oh my god, you're gonna destroy me. I'm loud. Look at... My controller is blinking here. I have no control. <laughs> Holy fuck. Holy shit. <laughs> what, is that? what is this? <laughs> Are you kidding me? Yeah, that character model actually looks really good. Oh. I mean, my character is kind of generic and so is yours, but yours looks fucking awesome. What the fuck is what? this shit? Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna lose my control. What the fuck? That fucking explosion. How are you doing these moves? I'm gonna fucking figure out how to do something. Oh, what? <laughs> what? I'm gonna. What did I just do there? I don't know. Get him, two hit combo. What the fuck? 
What is, what is that? Is that my special move? I'm telling you to come fight me? The backgrounds in this game fucking suck, though. The stages, it looks Look, look at that! My moves are going through it. Oh, oh, oh! <laughs> Three hit Three. combo. Oh. Yeah! This is it, the rubber match. And my controller is about to die. I need to charge it up. Finish me! Oh, oh he didn't do shit. Fucking ravens come to fucking pick the bones. Yeah! Let's <laughs> <was> fucking get! <laughs> yeah! He looks like a badass there, and then he does that. Okay. Oh, whoa, whoa! Here comes. Oh, me. you didn't hit. You were gonna fight Jackie Chan? I was gonna fight okay, Jackie so Chan. Okay, so I gotta play this fucking chick. I've got to Sonya? Play. That's Sonya, yeah. man. Look at that. That is fucking Sonya. Marie. Jim Marie. Oh my and god. She's got. Uh, Whoa! She's fat. <laughs> Whoa, what a kick. That's a round of What? Oh. That's such that that is Look the, at that wait, see stop. my health? Look how low that roundhouse kick is. She can barely lift her fucking leg. I know, but did you see how much health that fucking took? That is pretty insane. Look at this, with this, they got some actress who has no idea how to do any punches or karate at all. What is that defense thing? What is that? Is that a punch or a kick? That's a punch. Uh, that's a pretty nice low kick actually for a tight kick. Fucking flying knees. What is that? <laughs> Eat oh shit. <laughs> He's gonna take out my lamp. Yeah! Yeah! Oh, uh, I gotta bring the belt home. Listen, the belt is coming home with me because I'm gonna smash you with these fucking. She sucks, though. Oh, come on! Oh, oh what? What? <laughs> what is what? that? That is her tip shot! How did she do that? Come on! No, 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 no. Oh, no. <laughs> Your hand's getting tired there? Oh, my thumb. I mean, this, I'm a, I'm a is, button masher. She is not very attractive. She doesn't have much of a chest either. And then I'm gonna hit you with this fucking kick. No, you're not. Come here. <laughs> I try. I can't even hit it. I tried to time it. Oh. What? This is gonna go down as a fucking. Oh. Oh. Get him! Oh, I get him with a dead shot! Yes. Oh. I'm gonna go for the kill here. I'm gonna do the tit shot. Oh! What? No, oh, fuck I. Oh, oh! I did it! What? I did something! <laughs> oh, look at her. She's, she's actually what? kind no, of attractive. I'm gonna let it go. You're gonna fight Jackie Chan. Right? Alright, let's go. I'll fight Jackie Chan. Are you ready? Whoa. Fuck, he's ready to go, dude. Jackie Chan. I wonder where they found this actress. Oh my god. Jackie Chan. Oh, Holy Jesus. Shit. <laughs> Holy shit, look at this. Dude, he's like so fast. <laughs> Holy crap. This, Holy this, shit. This is I'm like gonna Jackie fucking, Chan movie. Listen, I'm just gonna. I know it is. <laughs> oh, he fucking. He's countering everything I fucking do. Oh, I tried to fucking smack him. He knows exactly what I'm gonna fucking do. Fuck you, Jackie Chan. <laughs> He's fucking a cheater. Look at that! Oh, <laughs> he's bad, Jackie Chan. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna fucking I'm gonna be cheap here. <laughs> nope, he fucking attacks higher than me. His kicks are fucking come up higher than my chicks. <laughs> Fuck you, Jackie Chan. I'm fucking get him. Fuck oh. you! You, that's it. Let's get back to the fight. <laughs> what? Wait, he's finishing you up. Fuck that! <laughs> he just hit you with the dragon balls. <laughs> Fuck you, Jared, the dragon balls. Literally, he's laughing about it. Fuck you, Jack. You fucking jack off. Fuck you. <laughs> that's it. We gotta get back to the fights. Fuck you, Jackie. And our second half's about to begin.
んな今までもう本当世界のトップの人たちとやらせてもらってすごい経験をたくさん積ませてもらったんでプライドにはそれをいかに僕の中で噛み砕いて考えて耳にしていくかっていうのは僕自身の練習次第だと思うんで。My friends and family just say I'm crazy, but I, I just like the whole aspect of it. Uh, you know,、uh, I like individual competition, not team competition, because that pits your skills and who you are against somebody else and who they are. And、uh, ultimately, it's a matter of heart who, who's got the greater desire to win. And,、uh, So it's just a great sport. John the Saint Rankin, one of the new blood tonight, making his debut in Pride. They call him the Saint because he is a pastor of a church. He actually marries people. And his opponent. Is a man who really needs no introduction here in Pride, Akira Shoji. This fighter is one of the most action-packed fighters to go into Pride, and he—he's never tapped out in Pride. He's fought bigger guys, fought everybody, he fought Henzo Gracie, he fought Coleman. He's a little little eagle of Chanchin. He is like a pit bull, like a wolverine. This guy is nonstop, bam, punching. Unbelievable! You saw in the preview、uh, with、uh, Mark Coleman, he actually put him one time in a little dangerous position. That was great. This guy is unbelievable. What a heart and what a condition! Yeah, Shoji has been in. This will be his ninth appearance in Pride.、Uh, he was in so many Pride fighting championships events. Our fifth bout of the evening sees a returning Akira Soji, who was 26 years old at the time and had an MMA record of six, five, and three. He's facing off against newcomer John the Saint Rankin from the USA, who was 27 years old at the time with a record of 12, 17, and four. Akira Soji surprisingly makes an appearance despite getting his head smashed. By Mark Coleman, a beating that caused Soji to have vertigo and headaches for several weeks after. He is a warrior, that's for sure. I will say, I will say that you know, talking about the tournament and everything. Before the tournament, we gave Soji a lot of shit. Yeah. Because you know, from when he started off so strong, and then almost like let himself go,、mm-hmm. and then the tournament happened, and to me, he honestly fucking just redeemed himself. You know, because he, he he went fucking toe to toe with some fucking big ass names and got beat the fuck out of him. You know, but he still made it. He made it with Igor, man. He、yeah. fucking went the distance with Igor. Yeah, and he、um, he went the distance with、uh, Coleman,、yeah. which was unbelievable.、Uh, so yeah, Soji has a lot of heart. Yeah,、I'll、give him that. He's facing off against Peoria, Illinois native John Rankin. Holy fuck! By the way. At this point in his intro, I want you to do something. I want you to remove whatever music they put and just put fucking Deliverance, because this fucker's the hillbilly of all fucking hillbillies.、Yes. When he started talking, I'm like, oh my god, is he fucking a pig or something? My friends and family just say I'm crazy, but I, I just like the whole aspect of it. Uh, you know, uh, I like individual competition, not team competition, because that pits your skills and who you are against somebody else and who they are. And、uh, ultimately, it's a matter of heart. Who, who's got the greater desire to win? And、uh, so, because holy shit, he looks like an Illinois doofus. That's for sure. And Peoria, Illinois, is right down the road from Pride Resurrection Central. Here, Rankin has been around the block a few times already, mostly fighting in smaller regional-based promotions such as Hook and Shoot, IFC, and Barnes. He's fought in barns. He's <laughs> barns. a fucking hillbilly. <laughs> he's fought in, in the back alley of fucking. He some, does、uh, uh, grease pig wrestling. <laughs> yes. In all that time, Rankin had one single marquee fight, 
which happened in Pancrase in December 1998 at Pancrase Advanced 12 in a matchup that will make you scratch your head and wonder why. Coming into that fight with a record of 10, 8, and 4, Rankin faced off against legendary Masakasu Funaki, co-founder of Pancreas, who had a record of 36 and 10 at the time. A bit of a mismatch, you say? Yes. My best guess at to why this happened is that Funaki was coming off back-to-back -back losses at the time, including one to Shemi Schilt, a Dutch kickboxer whom Funaki had twice defeated before. Schilt by the way, will debut in Pride at Pride 16 against Akira Soji. Anyway, the Renkin fight I conveniently have video of. The result, you ask? Funaki would pummel Renkin into submission at nearly six minutes of the first round. Since that fight in Pancrase, Renkin has been a punching bag for a who's who of nobodies. <laughs> His record in 1999 was a dismal one and six. And his three fights in 2000 prior to Pride 9 here, he went 1-2. and two. I think we can guess why he is here in Pride. But I'm still holding out hope for our hometown hero, Rankin. I don't think I'll be surprised. So, I'm not going to lie. You just fucking broke my heart, man. <laughs> you literally just fucking broke my heart. Because here, for this match, I have so many notes on how well so you do it. <laughs> and, and how much he's, he's improving. And now you fucking tell me that he's fucking fighting a fucking word. Like, oh, oh my God. You fucking shattered my hope and expectations for Soji, man. Like, literally, I kid you not, dude. I fucking... I'm crying on the inside. I'm fucking crying on the inside. From his pre-fight interview, Rankin looks like... A typical Illinois jackass. And he's a pastor, too, apparently. According to Quadros. Jesus! Jesus! He's powered by God. Yeah, because his fucking nickname is The Saint. Yeah. The Saint. Who the fuck nicknames himself uh, The Saint? What kind of preacher decides, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go fight. Somebody from Illinois. <laughs> that sounds no, like you know what, an you know Illinois what, asshole. No, you, you want to know exactly what I fucking thought? It reminded me of Here Comes the Boom. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> As Soji is entering, fucking boss calls Soji a little Igor Volchanchin. He's a little, little Igor Volchanchin. He is like a pit bull, like a wolverine. This guy is nonstop bomb punching. He's got his reference and he's sticking to it. And I love how Rankin is introduced by the ring announcer. John Don Santo Rankin! There he is, John the Saint Rankin. Also, one must note Soji's ever morphing facial hair and hairstyles. He doesn't even look the same anymore. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. Round one. Rankin comes out throwing, starting with a kick, then punches as Soji backs away. Soji moves forward and Rankin shoots in, but Soji sprawls, leaving Rankin on the mat. Rankin then stands. More punches by Rankin and not many answers from Soji. As Soji gets close, Rankin grabs him by the back of the neck and knees, then tries another knee that misses, then a high kick by Rankin. Soji decides to take this to the ground, and he manages to grab Rankin around the body and put him onto the mat. Soji works from half guard, but Rankin is active from the bottom with punches. Soji seems to be plotting. Soji gets side control, making Boss very pleased. Chin strikes, I guess, by Soji. Are those legal? That's the head. Doesn't that count as a headbutt? I don't know, man. I don't know. Quadro says he's chinning him. He chinned him. He's chinning him. Better than rimming him, I guess. By the way, before we continue, and I, and I forgot <laughs> to mention this as, as the time came. Yes. Um, boss, if you ever hear this, if you ever listen to this episode. Not likely. <laughs> there is no fucking way in hell hockey is any fucking worse than MMA. A lot of that has to do with uh, with first that people don't understand that no holds barred is all about. Rankin feels it's a sport first and foremost. He said that hockey is worse than this. Yeah, I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah. Jesus fucking Christ, man. 
This is a sport about literally beating each other up. Right, and fights in hockey. At the time, I would say there's more fights in hockey. Now, fights in hockey are, are pretty rare, which yeah, is pretty Yeah, but I mean, if sad. the entire sport is based on fighting, it's yeah. worse than a sport where fights happen. Yes. <laughs> Soji hops in the mount and tries a few small punches. Rankin seems stumped here, and he tries to reverse Soji by raising his legs high, and Soji very nearly turns it into a heel hook, but Rankin has managed to escape. Soji is standing, and Rankin is still on the ground. Rankin seems to be inviting Soji to come get some. Soji moves in and doesn't do anything at first before he crowds Rankin and tries to grab a foot. Soji's back in and he kicks at Rankin. Taking a page out of Sakuraba's book, Soji holds on to Rankin's foot and twirls above him. What he did next, not sure. Soji passes. <laughs> Soji passes and then gets pushed out in the side guard. Soji then gets back in the full mount. Five minutes passed in round one. Soji with slow work, occasionally throwing a looping punch. Rankin tries to punch back, but Soji is really close. Soji is trapping Rankin's right arm and he tries to set up an Americana. Rankin once again tries to do the same unbalancing move with his legs that he did before, but all he does is allow Soji to fall right into an armbar, to which Rankin taps out. Oh, he's got, he's got a really good Akira Soji, winner via armbar at 6 minutes and 44 seconds of the first round. I have a note here saying that there was an awesome armbar. Soji has really improved. <laughs> I'm not fucking Still valid. Still valid. But not really. If he's going against a fucking guy with a, a 1 and 6 fucking record, no. That's not fucking <laughs> yeah. valid at all. Soji hits the ropes and then does a picture perfect backflip. Wow. Rankin then hoists Soji into the air in a nice show of sportsmanship. Good vibe. Tell us all the glowing remarks you had for Soji. I mean, like, literally. <laughs> like, I, I kid you not, man. Like, look at this. Look, just just so you know, it's like, Soji's treating this fight like Igor treated him last time. Like, he pretty much he's just <laughs> dominating and fucking all that shit. And I'm like, Soji looks so good. That was a fucking great on bar. I'm fucking sad now. I'm disappointed, man. I, I may never love again. I'll say this. Rankin was a very good matchup for Soji, who was in desperate need of a tune-up match, a.k.a. a win, considering he has been fighting top-level talent. So I'll give him a pass on this. Yes, Rankin was a sack of potatoes they brought in to lose. There's no denying that. But Soji has fought some of the top fighters in the world. Igor Voltanshin, uh uh, and Mark Coleman, two of the biggest F MMA fighters of, of all time. Yeah, and, and that's the thing. is That's why I had really good hopes is because I agree with you. You know, staying in the ring the entire time with Igor is fucking amazing. Yes. Plain and simple. Like, that does take talent, <laughs> even if that talent is being able to take a fucking beat. Yeah. But, which is why I was so ready to, to you know, cheer him on for his amazingness. It's just knowing now that his amazingness was kind of a sham. Manufactured. No, manufactured. Manufactured, yes, yes. thank you. It's, it's disappointing, literally. Yeah. Like, fucking disappointing. So, what would become of our two well meaning schlubs here? Akira Soji would be back in action at Pride 10, Return of the Warriors, where Herman Renting, a Dutch quote-unquote MMA fighter, and I use that term very loosely, will await Soji. Renting, it should be noted, only had two MMA fights prior to Pride 10, and both of them came way back in 1995. Hmm, five-year layoff. Hmm, only two fights. Can you say, man? As for Rankin, this would be it for his pride career. He would go back to being a punching bag around the world, fighting until 2005, and amassing a record of 18 wins, 28 losses, 4 draws, and 1 no contest. How does he get wins? Are there bigger well, sack of potatoes than him? His record at pride here 
was 12, 17, and 4 coming into this fight. So he only won six more times between 2000 and 2005. Jesus. That's pretty, pretty depressing. No shit. His only notable opponent after Pride 9 would be Joe Riggs. A main event fight at Rage in the Cage 60. <laughs> Rage in the Cage. Better than Rape in the Cage. Jesus. <laughs> Held in March of 2004 and amply named The Saint Comes Marching In. I guess Rankin was a big deal for Rage in the Cage? Riggs would KO Rankin, by the way, at 28 seconds. So long, Saint. We hardly knew ye. And if you're in the area of central Illinois, hit us up. Maybe we'll buy you a beer. I'm a warrior. I'm a warrior. There's nothing, there's nothing better in the world than rolling up your fingers, making a fist, and punching somebody in the head and not even getting charged for it. You know, uh, a lot of people go to jail for doing what I do. Um, I'd like to say to Rico, um, he's a very good looking guy and uh, it's afraid I'm gonna have to mess that face up. You know, Gary Goodrich is, I consider to be the top five of, of the pride. There's five fighters that I want to go after, and Gary's number five. So I'm going to take him out one by one, and I'm going to become the champion. So his fan club will be my fan club, and I will build each time as I go up. To be the champ. Nothing less. comes Boss making his debut in Pride. Rico Rodriguez from the United States, born in San Jose, California. He currently resides in Phoenix, Arizona, where he trains intensely with World Submission Wrestling Champion Mark Gore. And here he comes. He looks focused. One of the best on the ground. Yes, of course, it's coming from the Machado brothers. These guys are really good. But his opponent from Canada. The king of the one-punch knockouts, Big Daddy, Gary Goodrich. Uh, entertaining as ever. This guy loves the crowd. <laughs> He's great, man. He's a huge star here in Japan. Our sixth bout of the evening sees a returning Gary Big Daddy Goodrich, who was 34 years old at the time and had a record of 10 and 10. He's facing off against newcomer Rico Rodriguez from the USA, who was... Woo! You're happy over the USA? No, I'm happy about Gary, man. Oh. I'm always happy about Gary. <laughs> who was 22 years old at the time and had a record of 5 and 1. Hot, young prospect. That's hot, comma, young. Rico Rodriguez enters Pride and has a very tough Wait, test. No, one second, because I want to point out just how fucking creepily you just said hot. Like, ridiculously <laughs> no, creepy. Like, 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 you want to make sweet, sweet love to this man. He's a, that's, that's, that's how you just said hot. He's a good-looking guy. I'll, I'll, I'll admit that. Oh, where was I? He enters Pride and has a very tough task in front of him in Big Daddy. But just who is this Mexican muchacho? Born in San Jose, California, Rico began training Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu with the Machado brothers Higan and John Jock. In 1997, he grappled at the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu World Championships, taking the Blue Belt Absolute title. In 1998, he took gold in the 99-plus kilo division at the Abu Dhabi Combat Club World Championships. But Abu Dhabi. Always fun. 
But in 1999, he was only able to garner bronze, albeit that time in the Absolute Division, also known as the Openweight Division. He did pick up a victory in the 1999 ADCC against Murillo Bustamante, future Pride fighter. A month after ADCC 1999, Rico made his MMA debut at Extreme Cage in Phoenix, Arizona, where he won a three-round decision against a rather unknown opponent. Later that evening, he armbarred a second no-name opponent at nearly five. Rico spent the rest of 1999. Rico spent the rest of 1999 fighting around small regional promotions, including one named Armageddon. He only lost once in that time to Bobby Hoffman at Super Brawl 13 in September of 1999. A few months before Pride 9, he submitted Travis Fulton at King of the Cage 2, Desert Storm, in the first round via armbar. We'll never see Travis Fulton in Pride, but he has a very interesting story. He's an absolute MMA fighting whore. I'm Travis Fulton. I'll be fighting tonight. My style is uh, jiu-jitsu and wrestling, and I'm just going to have to uh, take him down and pound him to win. <laughs> Get this, fans. Fulton has fought over 300 times as of May 2016. Jesus. While also boxing 52 times. His MMA record stands at 253, 51, 10, and won no contest. But the majority of his fights can't be considered pro caliber competition. Still, it's on fucking believable. Epic fucking music from Pride for both men in the pre fight interviews. The guitar strum for Gary Goodridge is very familiar, but I can't seem to place it. It's obviously a ripoff of something else. Rico's music. Absolutely fucking amazing. <laughs> I love it. It's so good. And I wish I could get uh, pure copies of them without the talking over them. That would be awesome. Big Daddy really let us know how much he loves punching and not being <laughs> charged for it. As in arrested. Classic. Big Daddy also tells us he's going to mess up Rico's good looking face. Yeah. Oh, I, I like that. Uh, because Gary's like, hey, you know, um, it's a shame he's so good looking. <laughs> yeah. Because you know, I'm gonna have to mess up that face. Holy shit, Rico has no fucking neck whatsoever. Yeah, that fucker's huge, dude. Rico has a rather mundane walk out to the ring, getting leftover Mark Coleman's entrance music. As for Big Daddy, yes, he's fucking nuts, but we love it. Quadro states that Rico Rodriguez is the current heavyweight champ for King of the Cage, but I don't think that's true for the time. He never fought for the championship, at least according to Wikipedia. Maybe Rico told them that he was the champ, just to garner brownie points. Boss says he's nervous for this fight. Oh my God. This is going to be exciting, guys. I'm nervous for this fight. Can't believe it. So am I. He's definitely thinking there's going to be fireworks. Well... Let's find out. Uh, and really, I mean, Rico is fucking huge. Yeah, I, I like, can't believe the size shit. of his. I can't believe the size of his neck. It's unbelievable. I know, like holy crap! Round one, we. Uh, I was gonna say Rico. Rico opens up the bout with a leg kick thrown from a mile away, easy to spot, and Goodrich just eats it. Rico faints a lot. And just to show that he can do that too, Goodridge throws an uppercut at nothing, literally nothing. Rico dives in for Goodridge's leg and Gary Sprawl is getting a front headlock on Rico. The men then stand. Either Rico has bad knees or he's planning to spend a lot of time on his knees since both knees have sleeve braces on him. Errant one two by Rico. Lunging right straight by Rico that just grazes Goodrich. But I want to I point out, he has those things over his knees, and then 10 seconds into the fight, he's already having to fucking fix them. He's he's only 23. Does he have fucking bad knees already? Because those are, uh, I want to say those are like knee wraps. Those yeah. are knee braces. Yeah. Uh, they are, they're the, the rubber sleeve braces. But they're still there to kind of hold your kneecap in place. Mm -hmm. It makes no fucking sense. He's 23 years old. It does not make any sense. Holy shit, bad shoot by Rico. 
It was like from five miles away and had no chance whatsoever of succeeding. Rico then sends in one of the slowest, albeit nicely executed spinning back kicks I have ever seen in my life. He obviously spent more time working on the form than the speed of it. It got Quadros really excited, and because the crowd is dead silence, you could hear his voice echo through the stadium. Pretty awesome. Control again. Another shoot by Rico. Oh, back kick, baby! Begging, begging. Where did that come? On Whoa. delivery. Who would have thought that? That was a good shot. It, w it didn't have uh, a great deal of power, but it was right on the button. Right on the liver, as you said, boss. The man exchanged tapping punches and then another low kick by Rico. Rico jabs twice using them to set up a takedown attempt. Now he's getting it, but Goodridge sprawls and they are up against the ropes. Goodridge pushes out of Rico's grasp and then slugs him. Big right by Rico that doesn't connect. Goodridge hasn't thrown a punch in about one minute. When he finally does pull the trigger, Rico shoots in, gets the legs, and takes Goodridge down to the mat. Rico is in Goodridge's open guard. Rico then advances to half guard. He works body punches and attempts to pass again. Five minutes passed in round one and Rico lands some more strikes as he postures up for a moment. Goodridge raises up and bitch smacks Rico. Rico gives him one back. Re -re what, the, what the fuck happened here? Re -re -co -co -co. <laughs> it's all fucked up. Rico paws at Goodridge and like a klutz, he slaps Goodridge right in the junk. Goodridge groans and Rico seems doubtful that that actually hurt him. Be a little harder to armbar than Travis right. Bush, simply because of the strength. Oh, come on. I know. What happened? I guess they're going to refight, restart the fight. No, 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 no. Something happened with the uh, oh, right side. Okay. He probably doesn't realize that Goodridge has a giant, very sensitive slog. Not that I've seen it. I'm only guessing. But I mean, I mean, here's the thing is, um, I don't approve how he, like, made it seem like he didn't do anything. But at the same time, I don't blame him. Because, like, he was literally, he, like, you can tell he was punching for the gut. Yeah. And then Big Daddy, like, part of block, like, block and redirected it right into his crowd. There was very little impact. In fact, the ref, such a sweet guy, does more damage when he tenderly taps Goodridge's No cup. shit, I saw that. Was, <laughs> that's pretty fucking gay. Let's be fucking honest. <laughs> Uh, this is the same gay little ref that was really going to town on uh, uh, Soji's back. <laughs> Soji hurt his back. Yeah. Uh, on the replay, Quadros almost can't believe his eyes, saying he, he punched him straight down in the on the groin. He punched him straight down on the groin. Let's see where it lands. Okay. Oh, right there. He punched straight down with the right hand, right on the groin. Yeah. He's going to get a four-minute break, I heard. Oh, one minute break. Get the steel one. He punched him straight down on the groin. He, I, he, uh... Boss brings up the Pedro regarding this situation, a reference to a brawl that Goodrich had with the Pedro in IVC1 in 1997. Straight down on the groin. Maybe, maybe he had an agreement with the Pedro because... I remember an incident with Daddy Goodrich and the Pedro. This barn burner of a bare knuckle, headbutt filled bout saw both men toying with each other's groins in various manner, but Goodrich took it to a whole another level. With Goodrich putting his whole foot right through the trunks of the Pedro at one moment, and then later putting his whole hand down into the Pedro's trunks and doing something mysterious. He was then able to end the fight with a pretty good uppercut. Speaking of IVC number one, it was an eight-man tournament which Goodridge won, beating all of his Brazilian opponents and earning no respect from the drunk Brazilians in the crowd. He submitted his first two opponents in under a minute before running into the Pedro and fighting for 16 minutes. Goodridge, though, looked fucking stellar, super trim, and he had great boxing. Anyway, back to the fight. The fight is restarted, and there's a big right by Rico, but nothing comes of it. Rico shoots in again, but great leaping sprawl by Goodridge. Rico tries his shit back kick again, and it definitely needs to go back to the dojo. Three minutes left in round one. Okay, so it's 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 interesting because that kick was fucking terrible. 
Yeah, his back kick. Uh, it's, it's, it was it was fucking awful. Yeah. Let's be honest. I'm not a fighter. I'm not a fight, mm-hmm. like big fighter fan. I don't have the knowledge. Even I can tell that was <laughs> yes. that was fucking terrible. I expect I expect Takeda to do a kick like that. Yes. Why the fuck <clears throat> was Boss so? Fucking excited about it. The quad jersey mean? Oh, quad jersey, yeah. Control yeah. again. Another shoot by Rico. Oh, back kick, baby. Begging, begging. I'm like, why? <laughs> why are you this fucking excited about the Just shittiest kick? Just a back kick, yeah. Oh, my God. I was like, no, no, no. Don't be excited about this piece of shit. Dude. Yeah. Not much action here as both men seem hesitant to pull the trigger. They exchange jabs, then a long jab sent in by Rico. Rico kicks and double jab by Goodridge. Rico shoots in and Gary sprawls again and tries a knee as Rico looks to exit and just clips him with a quick right. Rico decides to shoot in again and he just can't get Goodridge down. Big Daddy wraps up Rico's neck and goes for a guillotine choke, but Rico heaves Goodridge up and slams him down, falling into side guard. He shoots again. Gary with that uh, front guillotine choke. I don't know if that's smart. Uh, A nice little slam there by Rico. That was was impressive. And and, and not only that, but my question is this. How beneficial is, is it to do that? Because you're burning up a lot of your en- energy, a lot of your stamina, trying to lift up someone as heavy as Gary Goodrich. Yeah. Because like it, it wasn't a trip. It wasn't like a judo trip. No. He literally fucking lift him, lifted him up. Yeah. I would say it's a quick burst of energy, and it's it's a lot less wearing down than if you're gr- trying to grind against somebody and you're struggling for the takedown. Yeah. That's going to burn you out more than getting that quick explosion, take him down. Okay. I was curious about that because to <clears> me... It seemed like too much work. Yeah, but how quick it was, it, it, it was it, almost anybody like in that position, you can quickly explode out and not burn a whole lot. Rico then hops into mount, but there's only one minute left now. Rico with light punches, and then he peeks to his corner for advice. But before he can get anything off, the bell rings, ending round one. Boss seems to have a stroke during the round break with utterly no reaction from Quadros. I don't know how to score this. Oh, I'm glad not to be a judge. Mark Kerr is seen once again in the corner, but this time for Rico. Rico would later join the Takata Jojo. Why? Why would the fuck would you? No, no, whoa, 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 whoa. Are you fucking telling me that someone who was already in the MMA world <laughs> voluntarily joined the Takeda Dojo. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of weird. I'm not sure if he was dumb enough to hand over his fight checks after he joined to Takeda. Oh I no, think- no, oh my... Has he not seen Pride? Has he not watched any Pride fights ever? Like uh, literally, why? <laughs> like, what like, can you learn from Takata? I mean, what not, would you be not, able to learn? But you not would, you'd be able to learn from Sakuraba. That's what I was gonna say. It should Sa- be called Sakuraba Dojo. Exactly, but that's the thing is, if you're joining the Takata Dojo, it's only to hang out with Sakuraba. Yeah. Because it's not gonna be fucking uh, Takata. No, no, no. You can learn from him how to well, fucking lose him. Yeah, exactly. You can. It's um, <laughs> another fucking little piece of shit that you can learn nothing about. Oh my God, why the fuck? No, no, no. This is gonna be like a fucking ten minute rant right now, because why the fuck would anybody actually spend any fucking time actually the going of time. there? Holy <laughs> shit! No. Oh my God. Okay, so. It's gonna li- say five minutes later. Listeners, now. listeners, I want you. This is the conclusion. <laughs> this pride has. Literally hurt my heart. Oh, fuck. First, I find out Soji fucking went against the work. <laughs> a fucking piece of shit guy. And now I find out someone actually voluntarily joined the Takeda yeah. Dojo. Fuck me. Oh, all right. Damn, that fucking took long enough. With that out of the way, round two. Non-committed leg kick by Rico, then a jab, and then a real leg kick to which Goodridge counters. Rico reels back and shoots in, and although Goodridge sprawls, Rico grabs a hold of a leg and then manages to put Goodridge down. He's in half guard. Some body punches by Rico, but not sure how much Gary is actually feeling him. Gary has Rico locked down, and not much Rico can do other than crazy palm strikes. Uh, um, 
fuck! Come on! Oh god damn it! Oh! Do you think you're better than me? How dare you! Fuck you! You beat the shit! More solid palm strikes from Rico. Boss describes the sound that these strikes cause on the ear. It's very annoying. <laughs> Rico steps over for maybe a knee bar, but Goodrich defends it with his own possible leg lock. Rico is extended here and smacks Goodrich right in the schnoz. Goodrich lets go and Rico gets full mount. He goes back to working Goodrich's body. Gary with some upstrikes, and then Rico tries for an arm lock before bruising Goodridge's midsection. Rico nearly gives Goodridge a chance at an arm triangle, and Goodridge gets Rico first to half guard, then down into full mount. Five minutes left in round two. Quadros details the five men Rico said he wants to fight, which is pretty much the top t five fighters in Pride. There are five fighters that he wants to fight in the Pride Fighting Championship. Gary is number five. He also wants to fight Igor Vovchanshin, Mark Coleman, Kazushi Sakuraba. Believe it or not, he mentioned Mark Kerr. Lots of small strikes from both men, and Rico playfully paws at Goodridge's stomach. Rico is locked up again, and he smacks Goodridge more before being released, and he punches all over Goodridge's body. He seems to be focused on staying busy, but not going for the kill, likely to just eke out a win here. Three minutes left in round two. Double palm strikes again by Rico, and then more hammering strikes to the body and chest of Goodridge. Rico keeps up with the punching, and Goodridge seems stuck here with not much of an outlet to get up. I mean, I, at this point, I'm having flashbacks to uh, the Pride before the tournament. Uh, Pride 8? Yeah, when... Was it was that though? No, where that wasn't where it. Goodridge uh, fought? Uh, are you talking about the Japanese guy? He, he well, I can't remember who he fought, but it was the one where uh, Big Daddy Goodridge was just laying down, and the other guy was hitting him, and he's like, "Hit me, hit me, kick oh, me!" Oh, Eric, uh, Tom Erickson. Yeah, yeah, and and that's the thing is, it reminds you of that because yes, the hits aren't affecting Gary, but Gary's not doing jack shit. Right. No. Yeah, this is very reminiscent of the Tom Erickson fight. Uh, Quadros, for his part, says it's a problem of timing for Goodridge. One minute left, and the ref calls for fight! Fight! Rico postures up and tries the punch. This keeps up repeating until Goodridge simply lets Rico squish his head with downward palm strikes. And then the bell rings, ending round two. We'll head over to the judges to find out our results, which is... Cross-training is the thing. And here he is, Rico Rodriguez, getting the unanimous decision over Gary Big Daddy Goodrich. Rico Rodriguez in an upset, winner via decision after two rounds of fighting. Rico does a handstand just to show off. Yeah. He's a good looking kid. But and, that was an fucking impressive handstand. Yes. Fuck and, that shit. and then he gets familiar with the ring girl who is either extremely excited or scared shitless. I would go with the second one. Yes. And with that, we're off to the next fight. Good vibe. Thoughts on Rico versus Goodridge. Okay, at the beginning, the beginning of the fight was was the most interesting part for me for two reasons. One, Rico was actually holding up, like standing up combat against Gary. Mm -hmm. But the part that really threw me off for a loop, Gary was actually not being the starter. Like he was waiting for the counter. Yeah, that's that's. To me, not so much not so Gary. Like, you know, for me, Gary is the one, the initiator, especially when it comes to striking. But in this fight, you know, you could tell, and, and I, I, I mean, even Boss and Quadro mentioned it because you could tell Gary was waiting for, you know, Rico to initiate because he was even putting his hands down. Like, hey, come at me and I'll counter it. And to, it, it was just, just fucking weird seeing that from Gary. Yeah, here's, uh, Goodrich has a problem with wrestlers. Uh, he had a big problem with Tom Erickson. Ogawa, who was a legitimate amateur wrestler, too. He had problems with Ogawa. Uh, and Rico has the fucking neck of a wrestler. And so I think Goodridge was hesitant to extend himself, knowing that Rico would, would try and take him down. Obviously, Goodridge was waiting for the shoot. 
he his sprawls were definitely on point. Oh my god, no, that was amazing! Like that, that that, that one was... leaping sprawl where he did where he he had to jump back. His sprawl was perfect in the first round, and then I think he got tired, and I think he got bored. Uh, I think he got tired of of sprawling. He just didn't want yeah. to do it anymore. And that's a, that's a big thing with Gary. Like you're right, is if he gets bored of a fight. You can tell because he'll start just doing the most asinine things ever. Yeah, I was a bit overall with a, a bit disappointed overall with the fight, uh, but thankfully the the round structure right now of Pride the two ten minutes and they'll make it slightly better. Um, the two ten minutes keeps it interesting enough to where I'm not bored and wanting to fast forward. So that's good here, fight fans. So what would become of our two plump punchers here? Both men would return at Pride 10, Return of the Warriors, where Gary Goodridge would take on Gilbert Ival, a man we'll see later, while Rico would take on Giant Ochaya, also known as Takayuki Okada. See you then, boys! Ну, в принципе, я за месяц успел отдохнуть, чувствую себя очень прекрасно. Постараюсь выиграть этот раз этот турнир. Как именно точно не могу сказать, но постараюсь его выиграть как можно лучше. То есть, что как публика осталась довольная. Пропускай посмотрят, все решится в процессе боя. Our seventh bout of the evening sees a returning Igor Volchanchin, who was 26 years old at the time and had an MMA record of 42, 3, and won no contest. Uh, excuse me. He's facing off against a returning Daijiro Matsui, who was 27 years old and had an MMA record of 1-2-2. Two, and two. That's one win, two losses, and two draws. We last saw Igor fall to Mark Coleman in the finals of the 2000 Grand Prix after a long night of fighting. So it's surprising he's back so soon. Meanwhile, we last saw Daijiro Matsui at Pride 8, where he fought Vanderlei Silva all the way to the judges who then decided against him despite his efforts. Quadro states that Matsui has at least a survivor's chance against Igor, but doubts he has the guns to give Volchanchin any trouble. Draw against Akira Soji. So if he went the distance with those guys, then he has got at least a survivor's chance in this one, but I don't know that he's got the guns to give Volchanchin trouble. I agree. <laughs> yes, so do I. We see Takata in Matsui's corner, and he seems to be looking for Matsui's fight check. Fuck you, Takata. Round one, Matsui fakes a shoot, not once, not twice, but thrice. Matsui finally shoots in, and Igor sprawls, and Igor spins to get Matsui's back. Igor then lays down some leather. Ooh, the leather. Igor works body and head, and Matsui tries to escape but fails. Matsui tries to roll out and fails, then tries again. Igor has Matsui under complete control. I will, I will say this, and it honestly impresses me, especially from Igor, because when I think Igor, I think more of a striker. Mm -hmm. But this is literally the best I've seen anyone take advantage of rear guard. Yeah. Ever. And, and this is probably... This is kind of an unfair matchup in terms of weight. Well, yeah, and, and, and I Igor, get that. Igor is using his weight expertly to hold Matsui exactly where he wants him and to enforce his will. Yeah, but that's the thing. is even, even then, it's just so impressive 
how he's actually because you know we've seen fights before where people are in rear guard. And yeah, so Rama gave up back guard a lot, but he wasn't worried at all. Exactly, and, and that's and that's the main thing is because the other guy never did much. Yeah. Igor fucking exploded yeah. on fuck uh, just just punching him, and then and then like Boss and Quarter were mentioning, it's like. You can't tell where the punches are coming from. Right. Yeah. So that's that's Matsui an amazing, has no chance yeah, to defend. That's an amazing fucking position to have, and it's just like it was fucking impressive. I, that's pretty much it. Man. Yeah. Loud huffing and puffing from both men, and since the crowd is dead silent, it's the only thing you can hear. A hard left from Igor onto Matsui's exposed face, then. Igor smacks the ropes inadvertently. We're in the corner under the ropes and the refs halt the fighters to move them. And we see Matsui's concerned corner mid, Takata and Sakuraba. Boss talks about the size of Igor's hand. Once again, he's brought this up before. If you shake his hand, Igor's hand, it's like a break. This guy had such a big hand, it's unbelievable. He talked about this back in the Grand Prix, and then he says he's a bigger version of Akira Soji. The bigger version of Akira Soji. Boss! What is it? I thought Soji was a smaller version of Bolchanshin. Now, uh, Igor's just a bigger version of Soji? It's got to be one or the other. Matsui complains about something after the restart, certainly. We're in the corner, and here's Matsui is cut. Quadro says he doesn't see a scenario where Matsui can win this fight. The fighting style is really simple. Okay? Uh, looks like Matsui is starting to bleed. Oh, he's bleeding good. He's bleeding really good. Yeah, that's a bad cut. Oh, bad cut. I don't know that they're going to be able to uh, patch it up enough. It's pretty bad. I don't know if it's directly over the eye. If it's over the eye, they might have to stop the fight. Oh, that's bleeding bad. It's bleeding real hard. I don't see a scenario in which Matsui can beat Bo Chanson at this point. No, I don't either. Matsui's cut is right on the corner of his eyebrow, a little above the right eye. Apparently, at first, it's okay enough for Matsui to continue, and then we go to reset the position to which the crowd is besides themselves, groaning. Well, well, it's, there's some discussion there. Okay, I'm, I'm, I just looked at it. Okay, so he's he's going to go. Yes, he's he's going to go some more. Matsui is not a quitter. <laughs> oh, oh, my God. God. This is not... Uh, you know, it's, they just stand and reason. <laughs> That's right, folks. This is going to continue from where they left off. Matsui flips over and Igor is now in side control. And at least Matsui can now see the punches coming. Igor's face is strewn with Matsui's blood as small puddles develop on the mat. Five minutes pass in round one and the ref comes back in to halt the fight to once again check on Matsui's cut. The doctor apparently has told Matsui some unwanted news and Matsui simply goes back out to continue fighting, but the ref is waving off the fight. The bell rings and Matsui smacks the ring with frustration. Uh, the blood right I think they might have to, they're going to have to, they're going to stop the fight, I think. They're going to have to stop it. They're, you know, I, I know Matsui wants to go, he wants to continue, he wants to compete. You know, he's out there. It's over. It's over. Matsui is upset. At, you know, Matsui is a warrior. He wants to go and go. And like, like you uh, said, do bad for the guy. Yeah, Igor Wolf just gets the victory. You know, uh, Igor is in complete control. Matsui really did, didn't have a chance in this fight. Igor Volchanchkin is the winner via doctor stoppage at five minutes of the first round. Igor shakes the hand of Takata in the corner. Little did Igor know that Takata would be coming for him at Pride 11. Oh man, he's so afraid. <laughs> I can tell. Good vibe. Thoughts on Igor versus Daijiro? It was a fucking slaughter. Plain mm. and fucking simple. But, but, I will say this. As much of a slaughter as it was, I was impressed with Taijiro wanting to continue the fight. Oh, yeah. However, I am curious, once again, because my knowledge of all this shit is non-existent, what fucking vein is in your head that would cause that much blood? 
Uh, isn't there? So actually, this just came up. I think at a at a UFC recently, uh, a guy got a cut on the side of the head, and it was spurting like literally splurting blood. There's a vein over here. I haven't seen it pop out. Uh, maybe you can see. Yeah, that. I mean, I mean, I. But, but I uh, know, on the eyebrow, you're talking yeah. about, right? I don't know. Like, yeah, um, like, like the amount of blood that he had was ridiculous because it it piled up like what maybe two minutes. Yeah, yeah. Like, like holy shit! I'll uh, I'll also give Matsui credit for his heart here. He wanted to keep on fighting, and he was really upset that they stopped it. He thought that he could continue, but the doctor, uh, they were. This was the first time. That there was really a fight that had a, a cut in a bad place. Yeah. Um, so I think they were a little gun shy and they didn't want it to go too far. And, um, and it's understandable. And like, like, like I said, it's understandable and all that stuff. But you got to give credit where credit is due. And and he really wanted to continue. Yeah. Uh, honestly, I didn't see any scenario where Matsui would have an advantage over Igor. No, fucking no. Uh, no, no position. Not even on the ground. If he was in mount, I think Igor would have still been able to. Yeah, play. like, and 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 it's the same as as you know a couple. We've seen some of these Japanese fighters before, and and I don't know why they keep doing it. They keep giving up so much weight that they really fucking shouldn't. Yeah. Because I mean. Yes, they're, they're they they are good fighters, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna reject them. But they are giving up a retarded amount of weight. Mm-hmm. Yes, and even if they had like if they had that weight, it would still be hard for them to win. And then they give up that weight, so they just make it that much worse right. For this them. is like Takata versus Kerr. Even if Takata was also two hundred and fifty pounds. Kerr would have still manslaughtered the fuck <laughs> yes, out of him. Yes, but Takata was 200 and 205 pounds maybe, and Kerr was 250. Uh, yeah, you're right. There's no chance for these smaller Japanese guys to go up against these heavyweights. No, there isn't. And, and it's and it's a shame that they keep trying. They should because they are good fighters, and, and they honestly should get their chance, their, their shot, and they're fucking ruining it by giving up that much fucking weight to great fighters. I mean, yes. give up give up that weight to Manny, you know? Yeah. That's the thing. If you're going to do that, do that to someone you hold a chance. Don't give your weight up to someone like fucking Who's Baldwin, just as fast. to someone as fucking Kerr, and yeah. to someone like fucking Igor. Don't yeah. fucking do that. That's just fucking stupid. So, what would become of our two masculine man meters here? Did I say that? Ah, uh, that was fucking weird <laughs> that you said that. So, what would become of our two masculine meat masters here? That's even worse. <laughs> no, yeah. no, man eaters is definitely worse. Uh, <laughs> Igor Volchanchin would be... Listeners, bad. which one is worse? Say the first one. Masculine man meters. <laughs> That's or? It. Masculine meat masters. <laughs> <laughs> it's up to you. Please leave a comment. Which one do you think is worse? Igor Volchanchin would be back for Pride action at Pride 10, Return of the Warriors, where Ensign Inoue will await him. That should be a good match. As for Daijiro, he too would return at Pride 10, taking on the sexiest man in MMA, Vitor Balfour, but not before stopping by California to fight in a King of the Cage event. But for you to find out what happened in that event, you'll have to tune in to the next episode. See you boys at Pride 10! It's very easy. The bell scrolls ring. Um, my fist, my hands going very fast against the opponent, my knees and my feet also, and then a few seconds later, there's a lot of blood and the enemy and the opponent is on the ground sleeping. I'm very uh, happy to fight in Pride. And, uh, I love American guys and uh, Canada. 
Man, the winter I come snowboarding over there because uh, I heard the snow is very perfect over there and I love to snowboard. So if you want to see me, uh, then you have to be on the places where beautiful girls are and a good place to snowboard. the fans to to know about me as a human person you know I'm here to do my job and to make them feel you know comfortable and whatever they are if they in the bar or they in the house or they in the you know a friend's house you know I'm here to make a good show and I want them to know I'm a human person I have feelings you know I have good day bad day and hopefully Sunday you know can be a day can be a good day for you fans to, to love my work and hopefully, you know, I can come back, you know, again and do it again and let's see, you know, when I'm going to stop fighting. The Lord just Him knows and I'm here to do my job and stay out of drugs, stay out of bad company, you know, keep your faith in the Lord and everything be cool. Out of the evening and our main event features a returning Vitor Belfort who was 23 years old at the time and had an MMA record of 6 and 2. He's facing off against newcomer Gilbert the Hurricane Ivel from the Netherlands who was also 23 years old at the time and had an MMA record of 22 and 4. Vitor Belfort is back last seen in Pride 5 where he lost to Sakuraba by a decision. He hasn't fought at all since then, over a year, and mainly because of his broken hand that he broke in the fight with Sakuraba. But what about this tattooed Dutch named Gilbert? Born in Amsterdam, Netherlands, Gilbert grew up an orphan in the land of wooden shoes. At the age of 15, he took up kickboxing, and after a successful amateur tour, he made his MMA debut in Rings at Rings Holland, the final challenge in February of 1997, pummeling his Dutch opponent and causing a corner stoppage after four minutes in the first round. Ivo would rack up nine straight wins through the rest of 97 and 98, with all of his victories ending in a KO or TKO, including a TKO doctor stoppage against Dirty Bob Schreiber at Rings Holland, King of the Rings in Amsterdam in February of 98. But Bobo would have his revenge two months later in April at IMA KO Power Tournament, that's International Mixed Fight Association, where Schreiber would hand Ivo his first loss with a KO in the tournament finals. In May of 98, he would be disqualified for biting Karimula Bakaleev at International Absolute Fight Council, Pancration European Championship 1998. Whew. That was a fucking hell of a name. I have video of this fight, a video which can only be described as absolute shit, <laughs> but it's hard to see where Gilbert bit his opponent. Gilbert literally kicks this guy in the ass. I'm serious. He literally kicks this guy in the ass. Is that legal? Like, like soccer kicks him right in the asshole. And then, after the beating, some jacket-wearing nerd declares it a DQ. Very weird. The rest of 98 and the first half of 99 would be another string of victories via KO and TKO for Ivel, and his record had come to 15-2 and two as of August 99, with all of his victories being a KO or TKO. No decisions, including a TKO of Toyoshi Kosaka at Ring's second rise in April of 99 in Japan. But... In August of 99, TK would come back and avenge his loss with a technical decision win against Ivo at Rings. Fifth rise. Ivo and TK would have a rubber match in December of 99. Once again in Rings at Rings. King of the Rings 1999 tournament where Ivo caused the doctor to stop the fight after only one minute in the first round. 
Ivo would make it to the quarterfinals of the King of Kings 1999 tournament, where in February of 2000, at the finals, he ran into Hollywood Dan Henderson. Henderson would defeat Ivo via decision after two rounds of fighting. Henderson, it must be noted, would proceed to win the whole tournament with two more decision victories that night. Right before Pride 9 here in April of 2000, Gilbert fought Kiyoshi Tamura, Japanese rings legend, who we'll get to see at Pride 19. That fight was for the Rings Openweight Championship and Ivo with TKO Tamura after 13 minutes in the first round. Ivo would later vacate the title. And that brings us here to Pride 9. In his pre-fight interview, Ivo says he loves American guys and the Canadian snow. And, uh, I love American guys. And uh... he saves himself from being labeled a gay by mentioning something <coughs> about beautiful girls. Places where beautiful girls are. Whew, that, was a, <laughs> that was a close one. <laughs> Meanwhile, Vitor Belfort says it's his job to make the fans feel comfortable, whether they're in a bar or their house or even a friend's house. He wants people to know he's a human person and has feelings. He's such a sweetheart. Lynn Hart says that this is the ninth and final match of the evening. And we've only seen eight, so there must be some hidden fight that wasn't included in the DVD. Some exhibition, kind of like the Takata versus Atsuka fight uh, from Pride 7. Uh, no information was to be had at all on the internet. So if anybody knows what was the ninth fight at Pride 9, please let us know. Quadro says that Ivo's nickname is the Hurricane and Boss has a whole sordid story regarding that. Gilbert Ivo, one of the bad boys, the Hurricane from Holland. Yeah, that's what they call him, man. Peter Smith was the Hurricane in Thai boxing. And he got the name now, man. This guy is like, like a hurricane. Well, you know, he likes those tattoos now, doesn't he? He's got his trainer actually on his chest, in his left chest, Lucien Carbin, who is an unbelievable fighter in the days. 43 Thai boxing fights, won everything, beat it all the ties on their game. Kyukushin, he was the first European champion. It's unbelievable. He, he became European champion three times. Okay, here we go, the main event. But let's not piss around any longer. Round one, Ivo calmly comes out with a tie leg kick and Belfort beans him with a hard straight left, sending Ivo right down to the mat. Uh, that, I, I gotta say, that is a fucking hell of a hit from, from Belfort, man. Yes. Like, holy shit. Vitor falls into Ivo's guard. Vitor works the side of Ivo's body with punches and Ivo holds him close. Quadros talks about Gilbert's training in Holland and that he's learned to escape from the bottom any second now. Double squishing punches from Ivo sets up a barrage from Vitor. We're back in the corner near the ropes as Belfort continues intermittent punches. As Belfort starts to tee off, Ivo slips under the bottom rope and the refs spring into action. Gilbert has developed a nice gash under his right eye. It takes four, count them, four refs to reposition our fighters towards the center of the ring. I mean, it's it's so weird that, and I noticed this in earlier, earlier fights too, the refs are literally trying to lift them up yeah. and place them in the middle of the ring. Like, like four small Japanese refs. Like these refs trying to lift like 400 pounds yeah. of fucking solid man meat. <laughs> it's like, what the fuck are you retarded? More good punches from Vitor and Ivo scrambles, but all he accomplishes is giving Belfort half guard. More work from Vitor as Gilbert is being grind down here. Another good barrage by Vitor as Gilbert tries to answer back. Five minutes down in round one. Another stop and restart by the refs. More of the same here as Vitor looks to mash Gilbert's head. Quadros brings up Vitor being a changed man, a new Vitor Belfort. And he wants, to, uh, he wants people to know that he is a changed man and that he's the new Vitor Belfort. 
He's only 23 years old. How many how many times do you need to reinvent yourself at 23? I mean, I've reinvented myself at least seven times. <laughs> Three, My current invention is someone that gives a fuck about this fight. <laughs> <laughs> Three minutes left in round one, and we're still here. Another start and reset, and the men keep going back toward the fucking ropes. It's, it's fucking ridiculous, but I will say this. Like, being the main event that it is... Those fucking refs are on fucking point. Yes. Because the moment any of those goddamn fighters touches the fucking rope, yeah. and you even see their fingers try to bend over them, <laughs> yeah. you just see the Japanese guy, and ref just slap the shit out of them. It's like, all right, all right. I, 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 like I said, I give them a lot of shit when they don't do it in time. I'm giving them props because yeah. they're fucking, do they're right on it. Vitor postures up to throw some strikes and Ivo kicks him away momentarily. Then another reset by the ref. If Vitor is trying to not let the ref stand them up, keeping the refs occupied on resets is a very good strategy. One minute left in round one. Ivo's right eye is pretty much shut from swelling. Yeah, no, it would fucking look brutal, man. The bell rings, ending the round here with Vitor still on top. Vitor helps Ivo up and gives him a sweet bro hug. Ivo checks his cut in the big screen, and Quadro says it's time for Ivo to regroup and turn up the steam. Round two! Ivo comes right out with a just missing back kick, but Belfort gets a hold of him and takes him down to the mat. Oh boy. I mean, Belfort is dominating this match so far, man. Even like on the ground and everything. Fucking Ivo has no defense to the takedown. No, he has he has no defense in general. <laughs> like, Jesus Christ, man. Like this is a like this is the thing, man. This is a main event. When Vitor takes Ivo down, I'm hoping the refs will step in and say, okay, we saw this the entire first round. We're going to try something different. We'll see if that happens. The ref holds the bout for a restart, and he actually stands them up. The crowd claps in appreciation. And just held on. Sometimes explosive movements, left, right, left, like an even turn somebody like that. Oh, they're going to restart it standing. Oh, okay, yeah. well, and then Vitor shoots in for a takedown as Ivo throws a knee. Ivo is back down to the mat. Quadros notes that Ivo has no sprawl whatsoever. Vitor goes for that takedown, but Ivo doesn't have a sprawl. Jesus. He doesn't have a sprawl. Vitor is in half guard and continues his steady work, but the ref seems anxious to get back in and stand them up, which he does after about a minute. Belfort wades in with a left and Ivo throws a kick slash knee type attack. And then Belfort goes for the legs, taking Ivo down again. Five minutes are down in round two and it's more of the same, albeit Vitor's punches have slowed considerably and have less oomph on them. He must be tired. Proving my assumption, the ref comes in to stand the fighters up and Belfort protests. Uh, form, uh, all these uh, people in the oh, 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 oh. Okay, they're, ha they're having some controversy because they haven't restart. Um, Likely because he is becoming exhausted and he wants to stay on the ground. As shoot will be coming quick, methinks. Belfort swings with punches and Ivo tries to knee him, to which Belfort grabs his legs and takes him down. Bajos, uh, Bajos. Bajos, is that, is that, is that, the, is, is that the, like, fucking uh, uh, out of wedlock child that they had? That Bajos Bajos had? His name is fucking Bajos? Jesus Christ. Bajos, ba Bajos is going to become a thing. Boss, Bajos' name isn't even anywhere on here. Boss correctly says that what Vitor is doing isn't really staying busy. He's not really passing the guard and is just throwing small punches merely to do something. I believe the rule should be, unless you are doing significant damage from the guard or are posturing up regularly and are not trying to pass, the fight should be stood. Yeah, it should, and, and it will definitely it would definitely make it a lot more interesting because I mean, but that's the thing is we've had a couple of fights already where where the fighters should have been stood up. There's been a couple of fights today where you know yeah they've done a little little bit of light work, but nothing that would bring this fight closer to an end. <clears throat> yeah, people bitch about laying prey 
tactics. And this is laying prey. You're on top of the guy. You're down. You're just throwing little and punches. And you're praying the refs don't interfere. Yes. <laughs> uh, and people say, but that's a legitimate tactic uh, because he's better at holding the other guy down. You can't penalize him for that. Here's my rule. I just said it. Unless you are trying to posture up and do damage or unless you are trying to pass guard, the fight should be stood up. If you're just laying with your head down in the guy's chest, throwing little body punches, doesn't fucking see, count. See, for me, like, the main thing about this is, and, and the reason, I, I, I like your rule, but the reason something should be done is not so much in the fighting part, it's the fact that this is a televised event. Yeah. And that's the thing. It's, it's a pay-per-view. It's, it's a pay-per-view. People are actually paying to watch it on TV. And, like, that's the thing. It's, it's not a cheap pay-per-view. Pay-per-views are never fucking cheap. No. So, it's all about the show. Yes. People pay for a show. And like I said, and, and like I said, and like Boss and Quadro said, this is not a show. Mm. So, if, if one of those... We got retarded amount of names that the most dangerous man alive today has read in people's <laughs> history. Yeah. If they want to do that for those tournaments, I have no problem with that. But when you come to a pay per view, I expect you to realize that you need to be fucking it's putting a, on a, a show. One off fight. Yeah, exactly. Three minutes left in round two, and Belfort doesn't do a whole lot, but he stays active, I guess. And now we're down to one minute, and our awaited restart looks like. It's not going to come. The bell rings, ending round two, and likely our fight. We'll go to the judges now to learn the result, which is... Yeah, both of them actually right there. No question. Vitor Belfort. No question. Vitor Belfort is back. Vitor Belfort, winner via decision after two rounds of fighting. Vitor celebrates with his trophy, and Pride 9 has come to a close. Good vibe. What were your thoughts on Belfort versus Ivel? Uh, I mean, it's, it's the same problem I've had with so many matches before. Great match. I liked it. it Bel Belfort is amazing. It was too dominant of a match to be a main event. Yeah. It was like, Ivel really didn't do much. Like, I no. mean, he had, he had a couple moves here and there, but overall, Belfort dominated the match entire way through both rounds. And and to me, once again, that does not make for a good show. Gilbert's mistake was when they were stood up, he tried to go for an attack that left him open to be taken down. Every fucking time you're standing. Exactly. And that, that's what I'm saying is, is he had no counter to Belfort, and Belfort no. dominated the fucking match. I was disappointed, I'll say this. Vitor played it really safe. He was coming off a year layoff from his broken hand against Sakuraba, so maybe that's why he did it. But as Pride will do in the future, they will penalize boring fighters by never bringing them back. I don't think Vitor at this point is in danger of that happening because he's still a really big name. I just think he's got to be careful with this fucking lay and pray bullshit. Ivel had no answers for B uh, Vitor. Uh, he's got to get back in the gym and work on his fucking sprawl. Yeah, no, definitely, man. And and, and that's the thing. It's, 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 it just wasn't, wasn't a main, main event fight. No. Give me this at the beginning of the, of the card. I have no problem with it. Yes. So, what would become of our two hot young pugilists here? Both men would return to Pride at Pride 10, will, where Belfort will take on Daijiro Matsui and Ivo will take on Gary Goodridge. See you boys next episode. What were your overall thoughts on Pride 9? It's a step back. I will say this. We, we just had this amazing Pride tournament with really good fights. I, I will say this before before I say any more bad things. One of the main things I am really happy about and I really loved about this pride is that they fucking finally, finally made the rules the same for every fucking fight. Mm -hmm. So now you don't have any surprises, any surprise fucking like fourth rounds or any surprise hour and a half fucking battles. I love that. I love that. But you had these fights in the tournament where... All of, like, to me, most of the fights were 
active, we're, we're great, we're engaging. Then you come back here and you come back to like at least three of them where it's nothing but like laying on the fucking ground, you know, making sweet, sweet love to each other. That's yeah. that's pretty much all it fucking was. Yeah, this Pride is pretty forgettable. Um, it was a quick event because of the fixes to the round time. Uh, but the matchups fucking suck. The matchups are where this event fell on its face. I mean, but even then, like some of the matchups that should have been great weren't. Yeah, they, they like, didn't I mean, pan I, like, out. I mean, and, 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 and to some of them, like I said, I blame the fighters. I Once again, just like we did a few prides ago, I'm disappointed in Gary. Yeah. Gary sh- Gary knows how to put on a show. He's shown it to us. He's He's done it so many times. And then he comes here, and it's one of the most fucking boring things ever. Yeah, overall, I would give this a 6 out of 10. Luckily, this is kind of like in this silver era of Pride, which we just entered, that that begins after the Grand Prix. This is kind of like a dark horse event. And we won't have to worry about something like this really happening. Oh, I'm glad, I'm glad. Well, now it's the time of the show where we pick... Our fight of the night. <laughs> oh my god, our fight of the fucking night now. Do you have one? I do. Okay. Um and and, and I will say this mostly because it's it's one of those kind of weird things. My match of the night is Barreto versus Trey. Okay. Um, I mean, at the very least it was active. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there, there was movement, there was everything. I mean None of the other matches either A lasted long enough or B I was gonna say my match of the night, by the way, listeners, was gonna be the Soju match. And then the most dangerous man alive today just fucking ruined it for me. Oh yeah, broke your heart. You broke my fucking heart. Broke my fucking heart, man. (laughs) But no, so definitely out of all the matches, that to me was the one that that was not a complete slaughter. Yeah. On one side. Um, this is really hard for me, and not because the fights were all amazing. It's like, <laughs> oh my god, which one do I pick? Um, I will say the best performance of the night goes to Heath Herring. Uh, as you can't count Carlos Newton's performance fighting a warmed over corpse. Um, Willie Peters was at least a potential threat and somebody who had won fights before. As for the best fight. I'm going to go with Igor versus Matsui since there was a lot of emotion there from Matsui and it felt like it meant something. It did. It did. But once again, too quick of a fucking match for me. I mean, too much of a... like. That's the thing. A great fight. But to me, and I'll say this again, it's about the show. And there is no show in a one-sided fucking slaughter. Yeah. Yeah. And that brings us to the end of another exciting episode. Wow, what a show. The best yet. (laughs) We'll be back in short order for Pride 10, Return of the Warriors. What warriors are returning, you ask? Taking place on August 27th of 2000, Pride 10 will feature 10 bouts. How about that, fight fans? These bouts include... Oh. <laughs> hold on, buddy. Vitor Balfour versus Daijiro Matsui. Vanderlei Silva versus Guy Mesger. Rico Rodriguez versus Takayuki Okada. Gilbert Ivo versus Gary Goodridge. Mark Kerr returns, facing off against Igor Borisov. Igor Volchanchin versus Ensign Enoe. Masake Satake versus... Kazunari Mirakami, remember this if a shit from Pride <laughs> One. Kazuyuki Fujita versus Ken Shamrock. High and Gracie, a new Gracie versus Tokimichu Ichizawa. And finally, Kazushi Sakuraba will take on Henzo Gracie. Listen, you think this is bad? Oh, ten Jesus fights. Christ. You want to know what's great about Pride Ten? Uh, Out of the ten fights, only two go into the second round. Well, I mean. And here's the thing is, I'll give you this. Ten fights doesn't sound terrible now. Every time, during the first few prides, when you told me, 
oh, it's only a couple fucking <laughs> fights. And each fight ended up being like fucking half hour, 45 minute fucking snooze fest. That is when I was pissed off at you. These these fights, like for example, this Pride. Yes, there was a couple boring matches, but they went through. And they went through quickly and like, I mean, yeah, 20 minutes. 20 minutes, well, not, not the worst thing ever. Pride, uh, Pride 10 is probably just going to be, is going to be about as quick because again, only two fights go into the second round, and then out of those two, only one goes to the decision. Okay. So, by the way, listeners, if you want to know how bored I was during these fights, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, li- I'm gonna give the most dangerous man alive a link, and I took a <laughs> screenshot of the two monitors I use, and you will see my setup <laughs> oh, for watching this fight. Oh, uh, I know what's gonna be on that. <laughs> We must bid you adieu. So, for the Colombian good vibe, Woo! the machine who's somewhere out there, I am the most dangerous man alive today, and I wish you goodbye, good luck, and we'll sniff you fucking jerks later.